PowerPoint um, the actual transaction timeline. So from start to finish, every, all the steps that you need to do, I think that's gonna be very helpful for you. If you get a listing appointment or listing, you'll know you'll have a whole timeline of all the tasks that you need to complete um, during the whole listing process from the appointment all the way to closing. So I think that should be really helpful for you guys um, coming on down the road. So I, I start out with the, they always give the listing to the person who earns it, not the person who needs it. You'll have to earn it through good skills, right? So many times we, we're taking that first listing and we're like, oh my God, I need a paycheck so bad. But you gotta be a really good presenter, right? You have to really know your stuff for the consumer to feel really confident in you to invest in you, right? To give their lifelong investment to you is a very, very big deal. So it's very prestigious to be a listing agent. Um, it's very rewarding. It's going to definitely give you consistency in your business. And the, the saying is you need to list to last, right? In this business. And so that's what's gonna keep your business at an even keel. So your job description is to lead generate, to present, to be a good presenter, negotiate contracts for sellers and buyers, close your deals, keep your clients for life, and then do it all over again. So that's definitely, this is, this is what we do as a real estate agent. This is our life, to lead generate, be a very good presenter, negotiate, close those deals, and then uh, make sure we retain our clients and, and keep doing it all over again. Every day we start at zero. So eight goal categories of the millionaire real estate agent. The millionaire real estate agent is, is the sort of platform business model for Keller Williams. Gary Keller created the eight goals of the millionaire real estate agent and actually wrote this book that our industry uses. People have been in the industry for decades. This was their Bible. This was their learning tool was uh, what we call the MREA written by Gary Keller. So the eight goal categories are leads generated. You're gonna have goals on generating those leads, goals on how many listings you need to take a month, how many contracts you need to write a month, how many contracts you need to close, the money that you need to earn, the amount of people that you need to talk to every day, and your systems and tools for each step of your process. Personal education. Uh, there's a, each category, there's a someday, a three year, a one year, a one month and one week goals for all of these categories. And you'll find that on page 109 of the MREA book, that page will actually help you set up all your goals for all of these categories. That's gonna help you keep you in business. Listings are the key to a great real estate career. Taking listings is critical to your success as a real estate agent. So if you don't list, you won't last. Right, listings put the entire entire real estate community to work for you. You're the one that will control inventory and have inventory. So it's like having a storefront, right? It's having like a, a coffee shop, and the folks are coming walking in to buy the products you have on the shelf. That's being a listing agent, right? From your listings, you get buyer sales and you get longevity. Seller listings are the highest level leverage, maximum earning opportunity in the industry. It's a quote by Gary Keller and page 111 of the book. You all should have gotten the book when you joined our company. We'll go into deeper depth on that. So if you wanna study that a little bit more, that's the page to go ahead and study. A good listing presentation must accomplish the following. It's more than just a signature on the agreement, right? You'll be selling the intangible promise of a service that will generate a sale at the highest price, the least inconvenience, and the shortest amount of time. That's really the purpose. That's really the end game is to sell, get your client the most amount of money, the least inconvenience in the shortest amount of time. That's the whole objective. For you, it will provide you with a listing that is competitively priced and at your full service commission rate. For you to get full service commission rate, right, you have to give full service and good service and the, and the consumer has to feel confident in you. If they feel, you know, not too confident in you or you're just going to do the bare minimum, they're not going to want to pay you what your, what your fee should be. And you should all be getting full service fee and not be discounting your commissions. In all of your activities as a real estate agent, but especially on the listing proposal, 
you want to know that you have accomplished these four tenets: positive attitude. If you have a positive attitude going in me, go, uh, going into your presentation, that's going to feel like, um, you know, like me, right? If I have a positive attitude, I know you're going to like me. If I come in a negative, negative Nelly, that's, I'm detracting people, right? Mm -hmm. Credibility. If I come in very credible on my presentation, I'm going to build your trust. You're going to learn to trust me. And if I show you a level of expertise, if I show you the numbers correctly and you can understand my CMA correctly, you're going to believe me. And if I show you that we're at the same level, we're on the same team, I'm going to partner with you on this listing endeavor. You and I, Mr. Seller, are going to pick the price together. I'm going to give you a range, let you pick what's comfortable for you and your family. We're going to work on this together. If we need to change the price, we're going to discuss it together. I always use words together. I'm your partner. I'm your teammate. We're a team. That builds rapport and they feel like, okay, we're going to work together on this, right? Not that I'm going to be a boss of them. Pre-marketing and pre-listing. In order to reach both the goals of your client and your goals, you'll need to ask permission to drop by prior to presenting your marketing proposal and pricing recommendations. You'll want to give them your pre-marketing packet, which contains the pre-marketing proposal and forms necessary to set up and process the listing. So the listing presentation has two parts. There's the pre-marketing and the pre-listing and the marketing and the listing proposal. Pre-marketing is we go in ahead of time. We present to them ahead of time. We drop off materials ahead of time. It's sort of getting them ready for the appointment. We have a lot of marketing materials. If you have a lot of things that you do, you wanna go ahead and, set and send them something ahead of time in the mail or drop off to the door. If it's a listing that you know it's gonna be very difficult to comp out or you're not sure of it, it's a great way to knock on the door ahead of time and say, hey, can I take a look at the house ahead of time? Most all top producers use a pre-listing packet in some shape or form. It also cuts down on the time that you're gonna be in their house. A listing presentation can take about an hour, hour and a half. So if you kind of send them some marketing materials ahead of time, paperwork ahead of time, that shortens the length that you have to sit there in front of them. Plus it gives them an opportunity to get to know you, an opportunity to get to know the company, and most importantly, write down questions. It's this way you can address them all. And when you leave that night, there is no question in their mind about anything that you have to say or anything that you're gonna do for them. In our presentation and presenting, to be a really good presenter, you have to practice those, skills, those sales skills. It's a sales skill. And there's practice scripts and dialogues that you're going, to, you're going to learn in Ignite. If you guys have not been through Ignite yet, every sales coach, every sales program that you could purchase or any other brokerage office offers, even our brokerage Everybody tells you to practice script and dialogue, every single one. Tom Ferry, Mike Ferry, Brian Buffini. They all talk about, as a salesman, you have to learn scripts and dialogues. And there's a process to do that. Reading them aloud, standing up and role-playing, always smiling, role-playing with a partner, learning body movements and tonality. Those are all courses in a sales production school that you will learn. And guess what? You get them all through Ignite and you get them through Keller Williams teachings and coachings. I've been taught by Mike Ferry, Tom Ferry, Floyd Wickman, Brian Buffini, and all of those scale, sales skills and courses. I spent like thousand dollars a month on some of that stuff. And it helps you be versatile. It helps you read people. It helps you build rapport with people. I can be in a room with somebody and I become a chameleon. If they're from the East Coast and talk really fast, I could do that. If for their down south and they kind of draw things out, they need to think a while and they talk like this, I'm going to do the same, right? It builds rapport. I'm on the same page with everybody. So we have a listing presentation, the KW listing presentation under command under designs, 
And we want you to read through that presentation, customize it, read all of the slides. That way you can internalize all the features and benefits of listing with Keller Williams. You have to study and learn what our company does to get listings sold. Once you customize and read through those slides, we want you to role play and practice with a buddy that you have. Another great way to make sure to, um, that you're doing a good job and practice is videotape yourself, record yourself. I would sit many afternoon with um, a girlfriend of mine in the business. We called each other our partners in business. We didn't form a team but we would sit in the afternoons and just role play a listing presentation with each other. Let's get into working with the actual seller and the steps we need to do in pre-qualifying him and getting ready for the physical appointment. Pre-qualifying. Just like we pre-qualify a buyer, we wanna pre, yeah, go ahead, you can take that. We wanna pre-qualify the seller. You wanna pre-qualify the seller because you wanna know if they're serious or not, what their motivation are, is. Are they looking to sell now or sell down the road? It gives you their concerns and objections ahead of time. I wanna know what their most concerns are. My most frequently asked question before I go on appointment is, when I see you, what's most important to you? What's gonna be most important about my appointment when I see you on Friday at seven o'clock? That tells me they're focused, they're gonna tell me it's price or I really wanna know what you're gonna do differently to get my home sold or why is your brokerage different? If they tell me those things and I know how to hone in on my presentation, I know that's what I need to focus on or I know that's the topic of stuff I need to drop off ahead of time. Sometimes I'll do a video if they want to, if there's, well, I'm really concerned about the market and where the market's going, I'll send them market information and I'll do a video where I'll actually talk to them about the market. This way that's five, 10 minutes I can take off the table when I'm there that night. By asking them a bunch of questions and pre-qualifying, it also demonstrates your professionalism. If you, Believe it or not, people like want to be quiet and be secret agent. I'm not going to ask them anything. I'm just going to show up to their house and throw a CMA at them. That doesn't show any professionalism at all. If the homeowner sees you asking questions and really doing a deep dive, then they feel confident. Okay, she's going to know what I need to do. She's going to know what I need, what I want. Plus, it gives you information for building rapport with them. Here's a simple, a sample qualification dialogue. Hey Joe, it's Karen with Keller Williams Premier. I'm calling to confirm our appointment for Friday at seven o'clock. Does that time still work for you? I'm really excited about the opportunity to sell your home. I take this process very, I take this process very seriously and I'm committed to getting your property sold at the highest price in the shortest time frame. I wanna be 100% pre prepared before I come out. So I have some questions to ask you. Do you have a few minutes? So very short and sweet, right? I'm really excited for the opportunity to sell your home. I take this process very seriously. I'm committed to getting your property sold at the highest price in the shortest amount of time in the least amount of convenience. So I wanna be 100% pre prepared. So I have some questions. Do you have a few minutes? Very simple, right? I kind of let the expectation out there. I really want to do a good job for you. I want to ask you a bunch of questions. And here are those sample questions that you need to know. Let's confirm when you sell your home, you're moving to, I want to confirm where they're moving to, why they're moving. And you want to be there by when? I need to know when. If they're in their mind, they're thinking they want to be, you know, in Colorado for family, which is the homecoming. I call it, oh, you know, it's a homecoming for you. 
So when do you want to be there? When do you want to see your family? When do you need to start your job? If they tell me, well, I need to start in 30 days. Well, we need to get your home on the market today. They said, well, I don't start my job or we don't need to move for three to four months. And that gives me a long runway, right? To get their home sold. As our market changes and our market is changing, I'm sure some of you seeing the signs of changing now, as our market changes, the longer they stay on the market starts to lengthen, right? Right now, a consumer can guess, oh, I'll get my home on the market in a week or two, 30 days to sell. So they can plan about 45, 60 days, they'll be out. In a normal market, it takes two to three months to get a sale and then another 30 to close. So you're four months out. As our market starts to slow up or get stable or decline, there's gonna be areas of Houston that go on the decline, things get very elongated. It takes a really long time. You need to prepare them for that. That's knowing your market. That's what the information is gonna help them make some financial decisions for their family. Booking movers, planning, you know, when to pack up and those things, planning school registrations and school to exiting, right? All those are very, very important factors. Tell me again, what's your main reasons for selling this property? I want to know why they're selling for a job, for school. I hate the neighbor. It floods all the time. It's very noisy. I'm fighting with the neighbor. Whatever the situation is, you really need to know because you're gonna gear your marketing towards that and your advertising towards that. So what price do you want to sell your home for? I always ask, have you talked to neighbors about selling? Have you, have you had any of your friends in the neighborhood sell? What were you thinking in your mind your home could sell for? I wanna know where the, what they're thinking, where their ballpark is. I'm not going to customize my price towards that, but it helps me know how I need to educate them on pricing, right? I'm curious, what price won't you go below? This is not really a question maybe right now, but in a stable market, declining market, that is an important thing to know. What price is your bottom line? What price will you be upside down in? What price is a hardship for you? How much money do you absolutely need to have out of here so you can get to your next house? When people have a hardship and they have no equity, they're looking at money just to get out to pay a mover, right? They're looking money to get out if it's a divorce situation to pay off their debt, right? So knowing that helps you with pricing of their property. And if they tell me a price, well, how did you determine that price? They may say, well, Mary and, and, and Joe down the block sold for this. Or I looked it up on Zillow. Or I had another realtor come in and tell me. When you want to know where they're getting their information from, especially if they're dealing with another real estate agent. You need to know how much they owe on the property. How much do you owe on the property? And can I prepare an estimated net sheet that will give you a ballpark of what you will walk away with at your closing? Will you find that helpful? We wanna be able to give them a net sheet when you walk away. So this way they know what they're going to approximately walk away with. They can also use that worksheet when you present them an offer. It helps them decide on the offer price. Right now, sellers are getting list price a little bit over. Our sales price to list price ratio in our market area is 104.6%, I believe it is. In a normal market, can you guess what that sales price to list, list price ratio is? Do you know what that is? 96 to 97%. So right now we're at 104. So third, you know, Q3, Q1 of next year, we're not going to be at 104. We'll probably be at 100 or we'll be at that 99, 98%.
So that tells you the average home gets negotiated down 3%. So if they're listing a home and you have to start doing the numbers and the math for them, it's helpful that you, you, you book that all into the net sheet that you give them. Especially if they're in a hardship financial situation where they don't have a lot of equity or they have some equity and they need every penny of it. Then I like to ask them, is there anything that could be perceived as negative that could also impact the property value? I ask them off the bat, is there, is there anything wrong with the property, anything wrong with the area, the location? Are there any special features of the home you feel could also impact the value in a positive way? Have you done any improvements, any special options that you purchased at the time you built the home? Or when you bought it, you know, what upgrades have you done? The next most important question is, will all the decision makers be there when I arrive? There's nothing worse than going on, on a listing appointment. You do, you know, two, three days worth of work. You sit down for hours doing a CMA. A CMA takes about two and a half, three hours to do. So you spend all this time, probably three, four days, full days full of work. And then you get there and the decision makers aren't there. That's a waste of your time. So you wanna make sure if it's husband and wife, husband and wife are there. And then what is the most important topic you want to discuss when we meet? What's most important to you about our meeting on Friday? What are the biggest concerns you have about listing your home? And then there's the close. Obviously, if you're as confident as I am that I can sell your home, will, be, will you be ready to list with me at the appointment? Wonderful, please have a copy of your key handy for me. This sounds great. I have everything I need to prepare. I look forward to seeing you Friday at seven o'clock. Have a great day. If you feel comfortable and confident after I leave your home on Friday, Mohan, will you be ready to list your home? Keep it very simple, very straightforward, but you wanna let them know that you're ready to list. You can bring a sign and a lockbox with you, be ready to take the listing. You wanna take listings right away because without having a signed listing agreement, you can't do anything. That signed listing agreement gives you permission to talk about the house, gives you permission to start doing your job, booking photography, booking stagers, getting listing material together. I won't spend one dime or do one ounce of work until I have a signed listing agreement. It costs money and it costs a lot of time. The house doesn't have to be ready to go live you just need a signed listing agreement to give you permission to do your job, to start your job. Without it, you can't do anything. Texas Real Estate Commission says you need a signed listing agreement, permission from that owner to act, talk, discuss about this piece of real estate being sold. Without it, you don't have permission to do so. It's like talking about some stranger's house down the block. Oh yeah, you know, you can't, you can't do that. Getting prepared. How well do you know the neighborhood? Preview all the listings and pended for sale and that you're using as comparables. Know where all the amenities of the community are. Record a video or promo before listing the home to show the seller. Show up physically, emotionally, and mentally. It's showtime, be early. So how well do you know the neighborhood? You get a phone call to go on this listing appointment or you get referred this person, do you know the neighborhood? Where the restaurants are, where the shopping is, where the mailbox is, where the elementary school is, where the parks are. That's what you need to know. Preview all the listings that are available for sale and if you can, anything that's pended. That gives you a bird's eye view, firsthand knowledge of what the competition is. Buyers comparison shop, right? What's comparison shopping? 
They compare features and benefits of one home to the features and benefits of another, right? How much bang am I gonna get for the buck? How much money, you know, what can I get? You know, how far is my dollar gonna stretch? What can I get for my dollar, right? And for some people it is literally by the dollar. For some people, I'm buying 3,600 square feet. I wanna see 3,600 square feet. So that means I tell consumers that every square foot of the flooring that you see is for sale. So if you're covering it up with furniture, you're covering up with things, they can't see what they're buying. Some people are very literal, right? They're buying, you know, a 200 square foot room. I wanna see the 200 square feet of that room. That's why staging comes into play, condition comes into play. Know where all the amenities of the community are, because that's going to help you in your marketing and your advertising. Mm -hmm. Record a video promo before listing the home, you know, for, for people who are upper end luxury listings, you're going to be competing with a lot of realtors for the, those listings. You need to be one notch ahead. So recording a video for them. I record a video, you know, um, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, I can't wait to see you Friday at seven o'clock. I dropped off a pre-listing packet. Please write down any questions you may have for me. And I look forward to seeing you Friday. Boom, I send it off. Show up physically, emotionally, and mentally. You wanna make sure you look good. You present well, it's a job interview, right? You wanna show up smiling and energetic and happy to be there. Even if you've got a lot of woes in your life going on and you're just not a joyful, jolly person, you gotta make believe that you are, right? We're actors, right? So you want to make sure that you show up ready for your interview, be early, be on time. First impressions are critical. It is said that the seller will size you up in the first three seconds when you walk into the home. So you wanna show up and looking good. You wanna show up with your stuff well prepared. If I showed up to a listing appointment with all my stuff like this, how does that look? It looks kind of like popping on the table, everything falls all over. What's their impression? You're gonna be like, oh my God, this one was a hot mess. But if I come up, and I present everything in a folder, everything is stapled and neatly put together and orderly, right? They're looking at, okay, organization. She knows what she's doing. She's calm, she's put together, he or he. Listen to the prospect. You wanna be a really good listener. Knowledge equals confidence. Sales presentation is asking a lot of questions. People don't want to sit there and hear you blah, blah, blah. You want to ask a lot of questions. Strong knowledge of stats is very helpful. As a new agent, you're not going to have a lot of your own stats, but our office has tremendous amount of stats. That's why when you're a realtor early on in your business, it's really important that you go with a very big, busy office. People say, oh, they don't like to do that, or they'll go pick another smaller office. Oh, because I want one-on-one. -on -one. And I want, you know, more small family feel. Well, that's just a kiss of death. Because a consumer wants to know, what are you going to do to get my home sold? What's your brokerage going to do? So it's more impressive. And they're going to be more trusting of what a company that does it all the time. A company that has a good reputation in the marketplace. Right? You're associated with that. So you're going to do a good job for them. So it's really, really important. I always ask people, well, you know, it's what, what are you going to miss by not being with a big brokerage, right? What's the business you're going to miss out by not being with a brokerage that's a power player in the marketplace? That's the question that you ask. Because consumers look for that. We had a phone call, lead call the other day that got divvied out for an $800,000 listing. And they said, well, we call because you, we know you're the number one marketplace, number one brokerage here in Katy. How do they know that? They Google that. You have the most signs on the lawn in the area. So we want somebody from your company to list our house. That says it all. 
So you're asking yourself, what are you missing by not being with a power player in the industry? So talk about that, show them that. They're already Googling it. They already know it. Who sets the price? The seller will set the price ultimately, but you give them a range. When you do your CMA and you go through CMA training, you're gonna be trained to give them a range and then present to them where the proper position in the marketplace will be, but ultimately they pick the price. And you want that to happen because you, if the home doesn't sell or you have to ask for a price reduction, you don't wanna be blamed for, well, you pick the number. Plus they'll sleep better at night knowing that they picked it. They have their try me price or they picked a good price and they'll be able to sleep better at night and move forward and not have remorse. Mm -hmm. What is included in your presentation? The listing presentation has two parts. There's the marketing action plan and the CMA analysis of what the home should be positioned on the market. I don't like to use the word listing, list price, um, try me price. I'll only use that if they're going crazy in pricing. I like to say, where do you wanna position yourself on the market? Because later on, if they pick the wrong price, I have to adjust their position in the market, right? So where do you wanna be positioned in the market? I include a list of references. For those of you who are new, if you don't have references to include in that, you'll use our business statistics. You can use testimonials that are, are said for the whole brokerage. We've been in this marketplace for a really long time, I think 23 years. So I think we have some testimonials about our brokerage for the last 23 years. Your plan of action. What are you gonna do to get these people's homes sold? And guess what? Keller Williams does that for you. It's built into your listing presentation so you don't have to invent that. For those of you who have sales, have done sales, Steve, you should have a copy of your track record included in that. Um, your mark, our market center stats, our, um, our MLS ranking, your ranking if you're a team, the CMA, the net sheet. Question on the net sheet. How do you do a net sheet when you don't have a price? I pick a price. I pick two prices on the net sheet. So when I go ahead and I do my CMA, I'm going to have a range. I'm going to have my low and I'm going to have my high. And I do one for each. Sometimes I'll pick somewhere in the middle as well. Because I love at the end when I go through and I see Mary and Joe, you know, what do you think based on looking at our solds and looking at our pendants and looking at our actives kind of, you know, it's kind of taking us where we need to go. Where would you feel comfortable in positioning your house? Oh, Karen, you know, you're dead on. And I, I think, you know, I think 350 is the number. Nyla was great. You and I think alike. I did a net sheet for you on 350. Bingo, right? I ask, what do you owe on the house before I go on the appointment? If you don't ask that question, when you look on the tax records, um, it'll show the last mortgage amount on that. And I just use that number. And I'll say Mary and Joe on the net sheet. I put in there what I thought you might be owing based on the type of mortgage that you took out when you purchased it. And I'm sure you've made payments and, and you have um, that payment, that amount due is lower. So just go ahead and you guys do the math. You're gonna have the contract in there, the disclosures in there. Your complimentary services. Every real estate agent, every team inserts into their listing presentation complimentary services. Some of those complimentary services could be you offer them um, a cleaning service when they move out. That's what I did. I always offered every seller a cleaning service when they moved out. This way you just have to worry about packing your stuff up. I took care of the cleaning when they moved. You can offer staging services. Photography, notary services, 
Heck, I even include electronic signing as part of my services. Mr. and Mrs. Seller, I'm a full service brokerage. If we need at any time anything notarized, you guys need to print, scan or anything, please come see me. I'll schedule time for you to come in the office. We'll handle that for you. Mr. and Mrs. Seller, I offer electronic signing. Anytime throughout the transaction, you need something electronically signed, I can assist you with that. This is services. We take it for granted as part of our job. This is a service to them. Convenience, right? A good experience, convenience. You guys need to troubleshoot and handle situations present solutions, no drama, no drama. If you're a person that's very sensitive, you're a person that's um, very emotional, that has no place in the real estate transaction. That's a skill you'll have to overcome. You have to educate yourself not to be that way. Can you imagine if you went into a doctor's office and you said to the doctor, gosh, I, you know, I'm not feeling well, or, you know, you know, I have a, my knee is killing me. The doctor looks at and goes, oh, oh my God, what's wrong with your knee? Oh my God, I got to get you to say, oh my God. I mean, you'd freak out yourself, right? Yeah. Right? You'd be like, this doctor is a lunatic. <laughs> There's no way I'm going to have him operating or looking at my knee, right? So you can't be that way in the real estate transaction. You know, if you go to the cell, oh my God, she called me and she's been so rude to me. She won't take my calls. I can't get a hold of anybody. You look like an idiot. Don't do that. Mr. Seller, there's been a delay in communication. As soon as I know something, I'm going to get with you right away. That's it. Don't talk disparaging about the other one because then they take that into consideration, right? Oh my God, this transaction is not going to go well. This is not going good. You look like you can't handle things. And what do they start to do? Handle things for you. They start telling you what to do. That's not the professional way to do. Do you think you can start telling your doctor what to do? No. You're a doctor of real estate. Look at it that way, right? It's almost a mal malpractice for you to act any other way. So you want to handle things professionally, calm, cool, and collective. There's a PowerPoint presentation. There's a print or laptop version. Be prepared for both. If I'm going to meet with somebody who's tech savvy, you know, they have a smart home, they've got TVs up all over the place. I'll have a PowerPoint presentation ready to go, or I'll have a print copy to leave behind as well. I want to be on the same knowledge uh, field, playing field as them. The process of presenting, you're going to arrive, you're going to meet and greet. You want to make sure you arrive early, present a business card. Is it appropriate to shake hands? Not all the time. I mean, back in the day, it was very customary in business. You shook hands with people right away. Not so much in real estate. What I do now um, is I'll hand out my business card and I do a nod. I do. It's not very nice to meet you. If they extend their hand out first, then I'll extend my hand out. You wait for them to extend that invitation first. Sometimes... You know, it could be right now a COVID thing, but it's also sometimes um, an ethnic thing or a geographic thing or a cultural thing. You can't always assume that people like to touch. If you are on the East Coast in New York and you're at the home of a Hasidic Jew, there's no touching at all. There's no touching, especially man to woman. So that would be inappropriate, right? I'd be offending them, it'd be very offensive. Some cultures don't like you wearing shoes in the home. So when you step through the doorway, right, you're gonna hand them a business card, meet and greet, very nice to meet you. Observe if there's entries in the shoe, a bunch of shoes in the entryway, ask them, would you like me to remove my shoes? It'd be very respectful, right? When you're going into their home, that shows respect. 
that shows that you're aware. Once you get through the threshold, you ask them, can I, uh, do you have a dining table or a kitchen table we could sit at? You walk to the table, you put your things down and then you're asked to be walked through the home. You're gonna take a notepad with you. You're gonna take notes of any updates, upgrades and repair issues that you see. Don't discuss things that you would do. Try to avoid that. People like to ask, well, what do you think? Should I do this? Should I do that? And what I say is, well, part of my service is, is when we get ready to list your home, we'll go through some proper things that you need to do to prepare it or staging. Do not discuss what you think of the home right then and there. Do not just give judgments for any of that until you know you have the listing agreement. Arrive back. Uh huh. You know about staging. Mm hmm. Staging is getting the house prepared, right? Yes. But um, who does that? We do it ourselves, or there's like a team or someone we can contact. So the there's company. a lot of material out there that you can learn and read and study to um, learn how to stage a house. Um, I didn't hire stages unless I was doing anything over five hundred thousand. That was a business decision I made. And so I have a gal that costs it's $100 an hour. I pay for the first $100 and she goes through and helps if I need it. And I'll use that for people that I know are kind of really sensitive and I'm not going to be able to myself tell them what needs to be done. For other stuff, I, I do it. And it's just simple, simple 101s of staging. All of their personal property needs to be packed away. All toiletries in a bathroom needs to be packed away white towels, um, white linen should be on all the bedding. There's certain things you're gonna to start to learn and understand that just need part of, be the process of um, getting a home for sold. I tell folks, you know, you have a wonderful, wonderful home. You lived in it in 20, 30 years and you've made a home for you and your family. But now you have to think of this as a house, a house that we have to sell and get on the market. So it needs to be a house that somebody else can picture as their home. So it's really important that we take down, you know, um, personal items and those things. I also warn them that this is going to go on the internet. There's about 50 photos or so that's going to be of this home and video. And so we want to make sure we, we remove pictures of your children, your children's names, anything that can um, show your name, those diplomas and those college things I tell people take down. There's been um, identity theft, identity fraud from homes being on the market where, you know, a uh, nefarious character can go zoom in and they have your address. Now they have your full name and your university where you graduated. They can zoom in on a desk and look at bank statements and all of those things. I mean, that's just the world today. So I tell everybody, pack everything away, put everything away. You know, for some of those ladies who are really, really great at decorating, I say, let's just show off everything you got at Kirkland's and you know, nothing else. <laughs> you know, we, let's make this the Kirkland show place, but let's not show them anything else, right? So there's lots of staging. We have a staging book, I think on Keller Williams. Um, in the, um, I want to say in their marketing section that talks about staging and those things, but if not, um, finding somebody that can do that for you. I can even give you some tips and ideas to add to staging. Ask them to show you the home through the uh, eyes of a buyer. I'll do that question when I um, have somebody who um, has a really cluttered house, you know, who I know is going to have a hard time, um, going to have a hard time putting things away. I'll say, well, let's make believe you're a buyer, you know, and let's walk through your house, you know, with those eyes. And it kind of shows them that, oh, you know, okay, I need to put some things away. And then they start to say, well, how does this look? How does that look? And I said, you know what, I'm going to help you with all that. Once we get the listing uh, going, if you decide to sign with me, I'm going to spend, you know, I'll spend an hour with you. I'll spend two hours. I'll spend an afternoon with you. 
Sometimes we have to do things above and beyond our normal job. You know, I had uh, an elderly lady one time was a client of mine and my husband and I had to spend a whole day helping her. I mean, it's just sometimes you have to do what you have to do to help people, right? So before they sign a listing agreement, we don't want to discuss what we do with the house, but we can get their perspective as buyers. Mm -hmm. of yeah. What they would like to mm -hmm. see. You have to be really careful to start giving your judgments and advice before you really have the commitment for you to be able to do so. Um, people sometimes will take offense in. You know, I've had situations where I gave my advice and I said, well, you know, you should take those curtains down or, you know, you should really neutralize the collar. And in my doing so, I somehow offended her. And she went with another realtor who didn't do that, who was more loving and more gentle with her. So that was a learning lesson for me. I'm not going to say anything until I have my listing agreement. Then I'm going to go in and tell them what I need to do with the house. And I thought to myself, I didn't even have a right to really do so because she didn't give me the right to do so. She wanted to ask my opinion, but my opinion and my judgment has no place in this transaction, does it? I have to give them advice on what's gonna work best in terms of competition. And I'm gonna wait till I get a listing agreement signed for the light to, so I can do so. Pay attention to what is important to the seller. Why is that important? Because the seller will have certain things that are very important to them that they think are hugely valuable. They're very proud of. So to win them over, you wanna make sure that you, you understand that, you see that you're on the same page as them. Oh, you know, I spent $10,000 on this granite. You know, it took me five days to pick it out. My husband and I fought over this granite. This granite is a big deal for them. So I'm gonna make sure I talk about it in, in the marketing and the advertising. I'm gonna make sure she knows that I know this is valuable to her. I had a, um, a customer not too long ago where he was so proud of the fact his garage was so clean you could eat off the floors. He had epoxy flooring done you know, this um, high-end paint that's washable paint and all of this. He was very proud of that garage. When they were packing and moving, they had, did not have one box in that three-car garage. It was like a room to him. Do I normally take photos of a garage for a listing? No, but in this case, oh, it was in the video. There was two or three different photos of it. He was so proud of that dang garage, right? So I made sure we talked about it and I made sure that I knew that was important to him. And he thought that was a big selling feature. Measure the room sizes as you go and jot them down. So room sizes are important. Lots of agents take it, room sizes from listings prior or um, if it's been on the market before, I would just caution that just take your own room measurements. I don't mind doing, the, doing this during my listing appointment. If it's a big home, um, lots of rooms, I'll do it after. I'll, I'll tell them when I come back, if you, if you list, when you list with me, I'll come back. I'm gonna measure all the rooms. I'm gonna go through room by room and help you declutter and staging. And I'll do it at that time. Just all depends. It needs to be done, but you make the, the business decision on when to do it. Take or record lots of notes, listen, but offer no advice or opinions. The plan of action is what are you gonna to do to get their home sold? It's built into our Keller Williams PowerPoint listing presentation. You wanna emphasize the things that are exclusive to Keller Williams and our market center, what sets you apart from Better Homes and Gardens, Cobalt Banker, Remax. And you wanna to present to them in a fashion of customer experience, not customer service. We want you, you know, here at Keller Williams Premier, we focus on customer experience. We wanna make sure 
you know, Joe and Mary, I want to make sure you guys have a really great experience. You feel really comfortable. I don't want you inconvenienced at, at any time. Whatever you need, just call me. I'm always available. We want them to have a really good experience. This is first page of what our listing presentation looks like. It's fully customizable. You can add pages and delete pages. There's a modern looking one, there's a traditional looking one. My suggestion is you go in this week, customize yours and have it ready to print and go. The first page is customizable where you could put the client's name up there or just leave it blank. If I'm going on a listing appointment for anything over 500,000, I'm customizing it to them. Heck, if you go in anything over 400,000, you probably should do an extra job and customize your stuff for them. When you go through the listing presentation, the marketing part of it, the objective you want them to understand is that you're going to get as many qualified buyers as possible into to their home until it's sold. You're gonna to communicate to them weekly the results of your activities, and you're going to assist them in negotiating the highest dollar value that can possibly be had for their home in the shortest amount of time. Those are the objectives you wanna to relate to them. I'm gonna bring qualified buyers into your home. I'm gonna to talk to you every week about what I'm doing. And my job is to get you the highest price possible for your home. That's what they wanna hear. That's what you wanna focus your presentation on. The following are the steps I take to get the home sold. Submit your home to the local multiple listing service. Position your home competitively on the market to the open market versus narrow market. Open market versus narrow market. Do you guys think you know what that is? What is how presenting to an open market versus a narrow market? An open market, a broader market is having a price range that attracts the most buyers, having terms that are attractive to the most amount of people, meaning I'm gonna accept a cash offer, a VA offer, an FHA offer. A narrow market would be having a price that's attractive to just a few people. I'm overpriced. Having terms in there, I only want cash or investor. Narrowing your market is I only want to show my home a certain amount of time during the week. When people give me restraints like that, I tell them, well, you're narrowing your pool. You're narrowing the market that I can attract to the house. You're narrowing the market of who's going to see your home on the internet. So I, I educate them that we want your home as attractive to the most broader market as possible. Dee Dee. Why would they? Because they don't understand. They think they're, they're doing something, you know, in terms of, well, I don't want all these people to my house. I only want to show certain times a day. And I get that. I ask, well, why is that? What's your concern? Well, I don't want people just showing up at all hours. Well, they won't. They'll make an appointment. Will you feel comfortable if I make sure they have an appointment? They call at least an hour before. And I text you and the showing appointment service texts you and you can respond by email or phone call. And then make a judgment call right then and there. Oh, yeah, that'll work. Okay. You know what I mean? Root out the reason why. Well, why, why can't I have? Well, because you, you're going to narrow the, the amount of people that's going to be able to show your home. Do you want to show your home to just a little bit amount of people or do you want to show it to everybody? You know what I mean? Paint the picture of here, we need to go here. In terms of price, terms, those things. Discuss the obvious and simplest things. Note, they do not know how we do our job. Meaning, 
you want to discuss every little thing that you're going to do. I'm going to put a nice sign on the lawn. I, I use a super box versus somebody who doesn't have money and they use a combo box. Well, what's the difference with a super, a super box is an electronic box. It records who comes in and who comes out. You can't cut it off with a bolt cutter. It's very secure. Versus John Schmo down the block's got a combo on there. That's not secure. That's very dangerous. Anybody can have that combo and get into the house. I have an electronic lock box on your house. You know what I mean? You want to show and display all the little things that you do. Most people don't even understand about signs. I've got a nice sign on the lawn. Phone number is easy to see, easy to read. Those kinds of things. I'm going to position your home competitively to the open market versus the narrow market. I'm going to promote your home at the company sales meetings on the Keller Williams forum. I talk about that. Mr. and Mrs. Seller, we have two sales meetings a month, approximately 50 people in the room. I'm going to network and, and tell my colleagues all about your house. We have over almost 400 agents at our brokerage. And then over 350 agents at our brokerage. And I'm going to put it on the forum where we talk to each other. I'm going to talk about your house. I'm going to try to see if I have an agent that has somebody right away and match them up and bring them to the house right away. I'm going to develop a list, a list of features for your home for the brokers to use with their potential buyers for other brokerages to use. I'm going to call and email the top selling agents in the area and make sure they know about your house. I'm going to suggest and advertise as to any changes you may want to make in your property to make it more sellable. I'm going to suggest and advise as to any changes you may want to make in your property to make it more sellable. Mr. and Mrs. Seller, as we go on and we get feedback, if um, we're going to discuss those every week. And if we feel there's something that keeps coming up, I'm going to give you suggestions on how to correct it. And I'm going to constantly update you to any changes in the marketplace. If something new comes on the market, I mean, that's hot, hot look into the new sexy house on the market that puts yours to shame. We need to know that, right? Because then that's competition that's going to take the buyer pool away from us. So then we're going to have to adjust price. Quick question on feedback. Do you suggest feedback go directly to the sellers? Or no. You. Yes, so there's an option in our showing time where feedback can automatically be sent to the seller. I do not recommend that happening. I recommend that you um, review that first um, and then you can submit it to the seller. We have some people who are not so professional, unfortunately, in our business that will be kind of brutal and blunt. They think it's helpful and it's not. And if I know I have a client who's very sensitive, I mean, the one that has the five, you know, the $10,000 granite that she spent all week picking out, somebody's gonna say, oh my God, that's the most hideous granite I've ever seen. I, I don't want her seeing that. And I might just tell her, we got the feedback and, and the, the, the fit and finishes in the kitchen, mainly the countertops weren't to their liking. Right, because I know that's gonna upset her, throw her over the edge, and she'll be talking about it for the next two weeks. We don't want her to go there because inevitably that buyer might make an offer on it. So if I poo-pooed that agent and I poo-pooed that buyer and a week later they come and make me an offer, is she gonna be looking at that offer? She's gonna remember that that lady talked so bad about my granite. I mean, that's the truth. It's gonna become an emotional thing. I don't want, she didn't like my kitchen. I don't wanna to sell to her, right? She was rude. Oh my God, how rude was she? I don't wanna to sell to her. That's our job is to take that out of it, right? Our job is to make this business, right? So if you hide that from them, that's a good thing.
Contact over the next seven days buyer leads, sphere of influence, and past clients for their referrals and prospective buyers. Once you have a listing and a plan, I'm going to tell the seller, I'm going to contact my sphere, anybody who's referred me business, my buyer leads. I'm going to contact anybody and everybody. And you do that. You want to let everybody in the world know that you have this new listing. Add additional exposure through a professional sign and lockbox. Add a private code and landing page just for your home to have 24-hour information always available and for social media, marketing, and advertising. In command, you can start a landing page, have its own private website. You can get a QR code. I have a sign writer made where I say scan here for 24 hour information. They scan it and up comes the listing. Anytime I make a change, it's automatic, fresh and new, right? Back in the day, we created flyers and had brochure boxes. That's kind of passe now. People don't want that. People want information instantaneously on their phone. Plus those flyers, the kids take them and throw them around all over the place. It's just, don't need to do that anymore. Um, provide professional photography and detailed verbiage. Photography is very, very important today. People are shopping online. It's sort of like dating. It's like Tinder, swipe right, swipe left. So if your pho photographs don't look good, the home's going to get passed up. Also, it's very customary to put the, the front of the home as the first picture, a second view of the front of home is a third picture. Oh, then let me look at the street, you know, old school. In dating, right, and in looking at stuff, first few seconds, I'm swiping by, I want to be attracted right away. I want to feel excited right away. So the first three to four pictures should be the highlights of the home. If it's a $150,000 backyard, that should be your first picture. If it looks sexy and hot looking at night and evening, that should be your first picture, right? If they've got built-ins and they spent $30,000 in the family room, that should be your second picture. Or if they've got this stunning kitchen, every, every, you know, every chef and cook wants a big open kitchen with the white cabinets, right? Two-tone, five burner cooktop. If that's what this has, that should be your first picture, right? Remember, exciting. People are looking at it online. Pick me first, right? So that's how you market it. Tell a story about your home based on your story to promote I'm gonna tell a story about your home based on your story to promote the benefits of buying your home in addition to the features. Mr. and Mrs. Seller, tell me about why you bought this home. Tell me about the conveniences. Oh, well, I can take this street and it's a, you know, it's a shortcut and I get it get to I-10 in five minutes. I wanna know about that stuff. Or I got a secret gate out this way and the kids can get to the park in one minute or the kids can walk to the school, whatever it is, whatever their story is, why they fell in love with the home or the best features and benefits about the community. You wanna know that because that needs to be part of your marketing and advertising. You're gonna tell them the plan is you're gonna open, host open houses for the neighbors, for the general public and for the top selling brokers. Right now houses are selling fast and so we don't have time to do a mega open house or a standard open house. That's not normal. Normally we're doing open houses for three, four months in a row, every weekend. I can't tell you how many weekends I've worked in my life, a Saturday and Sunday, probably the majority of my adult life. It's just what we do. I've had listings where I had to sit open house Saturday and Sunday from 10 in the morning to four o'clock in the afternoon. I do what I have to do. That's what we do. That's a normal market. You're gonna work your butt off. But that's what we have to do. I would hold one for the public. I'd hold one for the neighbors when I first listed it. And then I'd hold one for the top selling brokers. If I have a high end home, I'm going to do a twilight evening, wine and dine for all the top agents in the neighborhood to come and take a look. So that's the plan. That's what you need to know that what, that's going to be your plan to get in the home sold. 
here's a bunch of scripts and questions that I ask of them. Um, I, we're um, kind of 20 minutes over where I wanted to be in this section, but I have scripts that's part of your PowerPoint in here. Um, here's a list of complimentary services. I talked about them earlier. Sellers home warranty coverage. That's a great one. Gloves, booties, masks, hand sanitizers. That's great. 24 hour info on the home. So here's a list of great um, complimentary services you can offer. Keller Williams, we offer also advertise in Homes and Land magazine, and you get a QR code from them. The CMA. The CMA, I'm not going to get into the details of the CMA because we have a class, but the CMA is analysis of your actives, your buyer, um, your pendants, and your solds. Also the property archive. The property archive tells a story. The property archive tells you the success or failure that a neighbor has tried and done. It's a huge tool in presenting a pricing strategy that should be used. It's helpful in addressing the try me price versus the, the buy me price. Property archive in the MLS shows you the history that a listing has gone through. It's gonna show you they listed at this price, it sat for 30, 60, 90 days, they had to reduce it to this price. Boom, five days later, it went to pending. I show people that's the sweet spot. That's the winning price. This is the price that was not successful. So if they're coming to me and they wanna overprice, I try to point out in property archives, well, that price didn't work here. That price didn't work here. That's the try me price. Do you wanna get your home sold or you wanna stay on the market for a long period of time? Is that one kind of percentage that you talked about earlier? That's gonna be in the quick CMA. The property archives is that little clock icon above the photo in the MLS. Do you do that for every listing in the city? I do that for all my comparables. All, all, all my comparables, I go through that. When I'm going through the comparables and the solds, I show them the MLS listing, I show them the photos, and then I flip the page, here's the archive. Do you do that only for solds or you do the expires? Pendants and actives too. Especially, come Q3 and Q1 where homes are gonna start sitting. Because now sellers what have the mindset I can list here and I'm gonna get my price and it's only gonna take a little bit. As we get to a normal market, what's gonna start happening? They're gonna ringy ding ding call you. It's been seven days, my, you haven't sold my house yet. What's going on? It's been 14 days, you haven't sold my house. It's 30 days, what are you doing? So we have to start showing them prices are coming down. Right? So we have to, we're gonna play a situation of being ahead of the market instead of chasing it. That's gonna be another market strategy where we're gonna to to start positioning our homes differently. So that way we're ahead of this decline and not chasing it, right? So you wanna show them a history of what's going on because that's gonna be where you need to go in the future, where you need to future pace yourself. So if this, if I suggest, if I'm in my head, I know the price should be at 350 and he's coming at me at 400, Mr. Seller, your neighbor down the street tried at 400. And then he went down to 375. And then when he went down to 350, he got it pended. So he wasted this amount of time. Do you wanna try that too? Is that a strategy that you wanna do? The solds is what homes have successfully sold and appraised for. This shows what the average days on the market for a home sold should be. This also shows the sales price to list price ratio. The pendants, this shows what the consumer opened their wallet to purchase. This shows what the consumer today is spending. It shows what the consumer is looking to buy now and what they can get for their money. Look for why the consumer chose these pendant homes over the ones that are still active on the market. If I have 30 homes active on the market and eight are pended, and these homes on the market have been on the market 40, 50, 60 days, pended means what? 
It's only been on the market a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. So this tells me they chose these eight homes over these. Why? Why were these more desirable than these? I have to show them that. I have to show my seller that. Well, Mr. Seller, we have 30 homes on the market. Only eight of those got chosen. Let's look and see why, they, why the consumer chose these eight. What makes them better than these? Because we want to make sure we look like them, not this, right? And always the close, always ask for the business. It's been a pleasure to meet you and your family and you have a lovely home. I would like to formally ask you to choose me as your realtor to sell your home. I, I This is something I got out of um, the MREA book. I like Mr. and Mrs. Seller. If you feel comfortable and confident, I can get your home sold. You know, can we get going tonight? Do you have any other questions or concerns? Oh, I don't know, I wanna sleep on it. Okay, I get you want to sleep on it. Can we sign everything? And if you change your mind in the morning, I can rip it up. Oh, you know, I'm just not sure. Great. What did I miss? Was I, did I talk a little too fast? Was I a little confusing? Do we need to go back over something? What could, what could we talk, you know? What is it that you're concerned about? What is it that you're worried about? Circle back and try to find out what it is they're worried about. How many, how many times did you press them for that? Just the ones. Mm -hmm. I'm not a hard, you know. Great. They say, well, you know, Karen, everything looks great. We really just need to sleep on it. Great. You guys marinate on this. Can I call you in the morning? And I'll call them in the morning. Or they might say, well, we have another realtor that we're going to interview with. Great. When is that appointment? Oh, it's tomorrow afternoon. Great. So it's okay if I call you tomorrow night? For a better experience, the number one thing you can achieve to make sure you have a client has good experience, feels comfortable with you, and is gonna refer you more business is communication. That's the number one plague in our industry, in our job. For a carpenter, right, is putting out a finished product. For us, it's communication. If we don't have really commu good communication as part of our business plan, it's really hard for us to get referral business. So communication and a good experience are the two things that you need to um, have as part of your business plan to make sure that you secure if you want to get repeat business. So you want to have a weekly plan to review changes and talk with them at least once a week. Giving them feedback, letting them know what you're doing. Knowing what's the best preferred method of communication. Silence is deadly, not golden. Communicate often in details. That is the number one reason um, realtors lose clients and don't get referred business. They didn't communicate enough. So I'm going to go ahead and um, I want to go ahead and get to our contract and addenda. Let's take a 10 minute break and then we're going to actually go through all of the contracts. Um, at the end, we're also going to do a listing agreement. And um, so for you guys in Zoom land, how is everybody doing? Fine, thank Good. you. Good, awesome. So I'm gonna go ahead Great. and attach to the chat screen a copy of all the listing documents that we're gonna go through. So this way you guys can follow along. And then um, for here in class, um, you guys all have a copy of the listing docs, right? Okay, so um, we're gonna take a 10 minute break right now or just five minutes, whatever you all need. And then we're gonna roll right through right till 12 o'clock. We're just gonna keep on going, is that okay? Okay, all right, so let's take five minutes. Um, let me upload for you guys. Um, do I have any, okay, good. So let me, is it okay, you guys, if I upload the PDF right into the chat? That should Hi. work. Hi, Hi. Um, yes, let me get you a copy of this. Angie, how are you? Huh? Oh. Yeah. 
Okay, this is what we're going to go over, and then we're going to do a mock presentation. So, as a copy for you. you need hi, a hi, hi. Two copies. Maria, Maria. Okay, this isn't double sided. This one's gonna be long because it's all on one side. That's okay. Okay, this one is double sided, and this is everything. You're welcome. Yeah, the PowerPoint. I'll make. I'll make some more copies of that. Is the PowerPoint? You have this. Okay. Okay. Hmm? You want to share um, before we leave? Or... The PowerPoint? Yeah, let me make a, I need one, two, I need to make three more copies. Mm -hmm. Count me? Yeah, I got you. Mm -hmm. I had some questions about some of the things you went over. Yes. Something that I'm not quite grasping is. Uh, when you're listing a house, the price of the house versus how much equity the people have in it. If they have a lot of equity, then they're not as flexible with the price. Like they want that amount. So if they have a lot of equity, um, there the pricing is not going to be the the pricing they want. You know, it has to be really relative to what's going on in the market. And you don't, it's not so critical to, it's not going to be so critical that you make sure you price it right. The market will dictate where you need to float. And it's okay if you have to adjust pricing here and there because there's equity there, right? Right. So it might be when it comes little... into play, is somebody that doesn't have equity, somebody that doesn't have money. They've, they own the home and they lost their job. They have to sell it within a year. There's not enough appreciation in there. So if you price it too low, it can't be sold because there's not enough proceeds for them to sell. They'll have to come to the table with money or you don't have a lot of negotiating room or they tell you, I only got money for two more mortgage payments. And so, that's going to be very critical in you getting the right price to get them out of the home quick and out. Quick. Okay. Yeah. So people who have equity right now, the market is dictating that they can almost ask what they want and they'll probably get it. That's changing. Mm -hmm. So when you go through a CMA class, we're going to show you really the solds and the pendants tell you where you need to go. The actors will tell you where you can't go. And so you're gonna learn that there's gonna be only a certain position they can play with. It's not a lot, a big leeway and it's not a shot in the dark. Right. Once you analyze all that, it's really gonna hone in where you need to be. So whether they have equity or not, to get a home sold, you always need to be in that right positioning. And everybody, don't forget to sign in with the and QR the, code. Not everybody you mentioned something about like making a video for the seller. Yes. Is that after, like after you meet them, just a follow-up video? Oh, after you meet them, it's a great follow-up. Or before. I'll make a video so that they see me before. They get to meet me before. Hi, Joe and Mary. I can't wait to see you Friday at 7 o'clock. Please look at the stuff I dropped off. If you have any questions, give me a call. Mm -hmm. um, it kind of gives them a way to meet you or uh, if you have something about the company that you want to send them and then a nice video afterwards john and mary it was so nice to meet you if you have any questions give me a call you want to do that for somebody who's savvy modern trendy if you've got people old school that don't even know how to do any of that then don't even bother yeah and then last question is when, mm -hmm. uh, 
when you're going through the house with the person for the first time and you know, like they want to hear what you want what you're going to do and like and, but you know you can't discuss mm -hmm. your plans how do you like steer so them away i mean you that? can but with limitations like limitations. If, if they're like oh you know what do you think of this wall and you know should i paint this and so you can say well we want to make sure that we look conforming to every other house that's on the market and that you show well when we go through our analysis we'll kind of compare and see what you need to do and, and I'll make sure before we go live, we do whatever it is we need to do to make sure you look good. All right, but without saying like, oh, I can't talk about that. Yeah, no, okay. yeah, no, no, no. Never say that. Yeah. If she's posing to talk about it, just talk about it. Okay. Yeah, you know what I mean? Why we kind of don't want to go there is because we want to make sure we get the listing agreement first, first and not offend anybody. But if they're pressuring you and they want answers, just give it to them. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Parent question, uh -huh. how do we know how to do that in that sheet? Like even if I have, if she tells me how much she has left. In her so to do in that sheet, there's the Title Snap app that I recommend using. That otherwise you have to go on HAR under financing, and there's a net sheet we're going to go over in that. You're tell us but you have to fill it all out yourself. No, if we do the one you just mentioned, Title Snap does it all for you. It's an app or something. It's an app called Title Snap. Title Snap. Thank you. Okay, so listing presentation, printable listing PowerPoint. Like that? Title is not? Uh huh. No, this one is there? Sorry, this one? Yes. Did yes. you really? Yay! Congratulations! Yay! So, how would the CMA and stuff go? Went good? Was it? I think they're still going to discuss the price. But yeah. I think I got it in their mind. Okay, good. Good. I think they're still going to try to do the timing price. Okay. All right. What was helpful? Everything that we went over? Oh, good. I think the wife wants. Um, set in a higher price, whereas the husband is more like referring to the CMA. So we'll, we'll see how that. There's always one that's going to be, you know, looking at the numbers and understanding. And then there's the, you know, emotional. She she's uh, she was a plant manager for the Dow facility. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I would think she would be more the numbers. Guy. And then, uh, we'll, we'll see how. Yeah, I mean, she probably has it in her head. She wants a certain price, so she could buy what she wants. And maybe the reality is she's not going to be able to get what she wants, money to buy what she wants is not something she should be easy to swallow. Does that make sense? So just just stay on it, you know. Um, so do what they want to do for just a short amount of time, like I said, you know, but then um, you want to make sure that you can go back and um, adjust the price accordingly. So I think we've agreed for me to send out the paperwork to them sometimes this week. Okay. So we're going to go over all the documents you need now. So hopefully you'll you'll learn in today's class what you need. We're going to go over the listing agreement now. And then once I fill it out, do I need to have a review? Yeah, once you fill it out, send it to me to review. This way I make sure it's all done properly. Do I have to send it to Lorraine as well? Lorraine reviews it when you are ready to close it out and submit it for what we call a DA. Okay. okay. And she'll she checks to make sure the signatures are done properly and that I want to see it before to make sure you're filling out documents correctly before they sign. She's sort of after everybody signed and agreed and negotiated to make sure everything is right. And then I need to set this all under an opportunity. And yes, I would go see Bren after this and she'll walk you through the technology part of it. All right, thanks. All right, we got a few more minutes. I'm gonna go to the restroom. You met Mir? Yeah. We met on Thursday. Getting in here. How many were on Zoom?
Ten. Ms. Gary, did you attach the PowerPoint to any of the emails that you sent? No, but I can send it. If you all have registered in, I can. Um, if you scan your name in there, Bren will give me the list and I can email it to you electronically. Absolutely. I need to print out some of, I need more. Let me go make a printout. We got a few more minutes, right? I need to make a printout. Hi. Yeah. Okay. You need a break, right? I'll just get you on the way. Yeah. Back. Okay. I need to print out stuff for the class. Do you got everything that you need? I do. Okay. Thank you.
Brian and Abel in that. So nice. Nice. Yeah. And then in our closed date, so like I'll get to work, my clients, and then like almost the night or four hours. And look, just make it feel like, oh, we can touch on your approach. You know, we're going to get stuff for you. You know, it's still going to cost for the end of the day, but I'm here with you so much. <laughs> they already showed me the contract, but it's cash and it's closed, and every other day is all the time. And um, like we said, we can put on the same day. Was that ten minutes? I fight. I don't know if I was on ten minutes. I try to print out that. How was your lunch? Dinner yesterday. Huh? How was your dinner yesterday? Oh, it was good. It was awesome. Yeah. That was one of my favorite sushi places. Where? Ra. The city center. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, I finally made the condo uh, contract. Uh huh. Uh, with the condo contract. Oh, okay. Uh huh. And then uh, ran it by another business. Okay. And then we submitted it off. Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> We'll see. Hopefully, we'll get it. Okay. Sorry, I didn't realize you had to do that last night, but I, no. I didn't have my computer. Yeah, that's, that's fine. Well, there's no way I can do all that. All right. Well, let me know how it goes and if you need help with it. Yes. Yeah. I mean, the only thing I had to do was just the time to the contract. Right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm going to show you the property. Uh, I'd rather you just try to get some classes in and then 
What can you buy in Houston for ninety thousand? No, so it should be the quite low, like more than thirty dollars. Oh yeah, yeah. So you need to make a good offer on that, good clean offer on that. All right, are we ready to go? How are my Zoomers out there? I'm sharing my screen, so I can't see y'all. I wish I could You're see great. Your faces. Yay. OK, can you see um, my contract up? Yes, we can. Yeah. OK. All right. All right, are we ready to go? Let's close those doors so we can keep it quiet in here because I talk loud. And... I don't want to. Um... I... They didn't come out of the printer, but we're just going over the contract right now anyway. So but I'll make Karen, sure I get it to at the end. Chat. Okay, if anybody needs contracts, I have a couple here. They're not so, on the Okay, chat so let's go and look at the listing contract itself. So the listing contract is 10 pages and every single paragraph of it is very, very important. There's paragraphs in here that actually relate to the one to four family. So um, it's really important that you understand what each paragraph is. This way you can educate the consumer, right? I'm teaching you, and then you're gonna need to teach your client what they're signing, right? And the do's and don'ts and pros and cons of everything that they agree to, right? This way um, you'll have a smooth transaction, less bumps in the road. Every real estate transaction has a bump in the road, but if you can, um, educate them you'll have less of those bumps in the road and um, things can go through smoothly so our residential real estate listing agreement exclusive right to sell the seller information you're going to get this from the tax records from them themselves it needs to match what's on their driver's license Whoever is on the deed must sign. So if you have a husband on the deed, he must sign. If they're married, both husband and wife should sign because we're a community property state and she lives in the house. And so we wanna make sure she signs so that she's aware the home's being sold. She's comfortable with everything that has to go on during the listing process. Question. Uh huh. Lease listing. Lease listing. Uh huh. Same, same husband, wife, or just Lease listing is the same thing. Both husband and wife, whoever's on the deed, needs to be party to the lease listing. If they're not husband and wife, <laughs> they don't have to be. Um, if they're not husband and wife, they don't. Ha whoever is on the deed. On the deed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. It's just good business practice. It's not so critical on the lease listing because we're not gonna have title company verifying and checking at the end, but you probably wanna make sure everybody's on the same page. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Question. So um, obviously like divorce, let's see, even if only one of them is on the deed, would that be all documents? 
Yeah, so the question is, we have a husband and wife getting divorced. Only one of them are on the deed of purchase, but at some point they got married and now they're going through a divorce. Is that the scenario? Do yeah, I have that right? Like, say, like, say the husband's the only person on, like, both the mortgage and the deed. Uh-huh. But because married, they're going to get married. But he's married. But he's married. Wife still has yes. Every um, so... If he's just on the deed and they're married, we customarily, technically just he needs to sign the listing agreement and the purchase agreement. She's going to have to sign at closing documents that she's aware of the sale and the proceeds go to both. We like to have them both on everything because then it it's full transparency it's full disclosure that she's fully aware that this is being sold because we don't want to spring it on her at the end because then the property can't be sold unless she's aware and comes to close it right especially if they live in the house together you want all parties who live in the household meaning the husband and wife sign everything right so even if even if uh like say she doesn't want it sold but he is on need and so if they're going through a divorce especially we want everybody signing because everything's going to go to both of them. If you have a divorce decree that says that it's a divorce decree that's been decreed by the judge and signed off by the judge, it's, it's all said and done. And the judge says, John Smith is to put the house for sale. John Smith is to get all the proceeds. Then she doesn't need to sign to be part of anything. The judge has decreed it's just John Smith. But without that decree, both of them need to be signing and on the same page of everything because both have to go to closing. Does that make sense? And, and then just, I had like, I had a listing right before I left Indiana that was a divorce and it was like not fun at all. No, it's very hard doing a divorce because they want to be sold and separate, but you can't treat them sold and separate, but you have to treat them sold and separate. So every time I had one sign, I'd have to have the other sign and it'd be at different times and I'd have to meet with each. But then you want to treat both fair and impartial and make sure you're transparent with both, CC everybody on every single email, conference call, all conversations. And so it's a very difficult situation to do, but you both have to treat both on the equal same playing field and transparency to both on everything. And I get sometimes they don't even want to be in the same room to sign. If that's a situation where they can't even be in the same room to sign, you're going to have to have duplicate documents. It is what it is. Been there, done that. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, is there such a thing as she could have a representative sign? A human being can have another human being sign for them, and that's called a power of attorney, but it's a restricted power of attorney. It's a one-time deal for the real estate transaction only, and it must be drawn by the title company. Many people have power of attorneys. They have their lawyers do power of attorneys that cover everything. It's not acceptable. The title company has their own power of attorney drawn by their lawyers specific for that transaction. And that's the one and the one and only that can be used. So if I take a listing and the husband tells me I work for Halliburton, they're shipping me over to Dubai. My wife is going to be here. I'm like, great. We're running tomorrow to the title company and we're going to have the title company draw up your POA now. You go, when an offer comes in, your wife is going to handle everything from soup to nuts to closing. Enjoy your trip. So I, I call my title company. I take a listing today. I'm calling Janet next door at Traditions. Hey, I'm taking a listing. I need a T47. I need a POA. When can my, my clients come down? She's going to say, bring them on down anytime. That's how that works. So on the parties to the transaction, whoever's on the deed must sign. Divorce, you know, we need a divorce decree if that's going to decree otherwise. A broker, this is the brokerage information, your email and your phone number goes in here. Property, 
This is the legal address of the property, the county, and then the common address. Improvements, paragraph B and C. Paragraph B and C means this is property that's going to be conveyed. It's the exact same paragraphs where, we just studied this last week, in the one to four family. B, C, and D are the exact paragraphs you're gonna find in the one to four family. It is the only three paragraphs that are duplicated in two different documents in the real estate transaction. Isn't that something? So that means it's pretty damn important, right? So B and C are paragraphs you wanna spend a lot of time on and read to your clients verbatim. This way they understand the state of Texas says these must convey. Improvements, the house, garage, and all other fixtures and improvements attached to the above described real property, including without limitation, the following permanently installed and built in items, all equipment and appliances, the valances, the screens, the shutters, the awnings, wall to wall carpeting, mirrors, ceiling fans, attic fans, mailboxes, television antennas, mounts and brackets for TVs and speakers. Those are the, this, par, this little sentence right here is the biggest issue we have in transactions today. Heating and air conditioning units, security and fire detection equipment, wiring, plumbing and light fixtures, chandeliers, water softeners. The next big ticket item that realtors are having to come out of pocket and pay for for making mistakes. Kitchen equipment, garage door openers. Yes, the garage door openers must convey. Cleaning equipment, shrubbery, landscaping, outdoor cooking equipment, and all of the property attached to the above described real property. The question on the brackets for TVs. Yes. So I've had clients remove theirs before we listed. Yes. We might have a listing agreement, but knowing that they wanted to take some with them and the rest alone. That's mm -hmm. okay. If I promise before we go live. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, if there's something in here that they want to take, I school them and I say, okay, before we go live, I recommend, I strongly recommend you remove them. Because once the consumer sees it, they want it. There's a, there's a saying, nobody wants what you want until you want it, right? <laughs> And so if it's something that's really important, you know, they have custom draperies, you know, they spent a fortune. Some of that stuff is very, very expensive. I had a client that had a $5,000 entry lamp in their entryway. They said, well, should I take it? I said, well, nobody's gonna pay you 5,000 for it. And no one's gonna appreciate that you spent 5,000 for it. So to somebody walking in, it's the same $50 lamp that the builder put in. So if you want it, you should take it and replace it with something that is standard and conforming. So basically we should advise the seller that whatever they want to pay to take it before the property goes live. Yeah. That is the if there's fair. something that should convey and they don't want it to convey, they should remove it and replace it with something that's conforming that they don't mind conveying. You know, you can't remove lighting and not put back lighting, right? So if it's a chandelier, just replace it with, you know, what the builder had. Or, you know, people have crystal chandeliers that are worth tens of thousands of dollars. That's like an heirloom. Take it down and put back, you know, put up what can go ahead and convey with the house. Why did you mention that this has been something that been dealing with so, so mistakes on the mounts, brackets for TVs and water softener systems. So we've had instances where the seller wanted to keep it and they were misinformed that it needed to stay. And the seller was extremely angry and the buyer wanted it. So the, um, the agent, listing agent had to let 
the seller leave the water softener system in there for the next buyer, but then I had credited out of their commissions check money so they could go buy a new one. The Cole Freer got, Freer got you to buy you a new range. Yeah, well, because we just moved here. We bought our house by them seeing them. When we finally got here three weeks after closing, I walk in and the range was gone. And so I called my agent. She's like, uh, let me call Nicole that it's still there during the final walkthrough. That, you know, and she called me back and she got in touch with the owners that sold it. And mm -hmm. they freaked out on her and she's just like, you need to talk to what you want. I want to look at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good <laughs> And with the TV brackets, Everybody has, you know, built-in TVs on the wall. So I, you have to instruct the seller that you can take the TV down, but the bracket must remain. If you need to have the bracket, you know, because it's specific to that TV, then take it down now, patch and paint, and make it look great. Right? Whatever you can do beforehand. Oh, the ring. Yes. Yep, that falls under accessories. Here's the next set of things that must convey. Window air conditioning units, stove, fireplace, screens, curtains and rods, that's a big one. Blinds, window shades, draperies and rods, that's a big one. Door keys, mailbox keys. It's your job as the listing agent to make sure they understand this. And with keys, I suggest a great business practice is you have a very nice envelope made up. You give it to your seller at the time of the listing. And, and I say, here's a manila envelope. As you're moving and packing, please place all your keys, remotes, manuals for your dishwasher and all those things in here because we need to convey it to the buyer. And I need to have it for closing. Because when the buyer signs, I have to turn this over to the buyer. So please start collecting those and putting them in here. That's interesting. So like handle them a folder so that they can prepare. Yes. Mm -hmm. above, ground, uh, above ground pool, swimming pool equipment, maintenance accessories, artificial fireplace logs, security systems that are not fixtures, and controls for the garage door the entry gate and other improvements and accessories. Controls includes sellers transferable rights to the software and application used to access and control those improvements or accessories. Everybody, well, not everybody, most people have those Schley keyless entry locks. Well, we're gonna need the codes to redo those locks. How do those locks work? Those locks now work on an app. I need the app. All that needs to be transferable because we need to have the buyer be able to get in and out of the dang house, right? And that goes along the same lines as the ring and all of those things. If you're going to promote it for the sale, you think it's worth money and you're selling it as your house, then guess what? The buyer needs to be able to use it. If the buyer is paying for it, the buyer needs to be able to use it and have it and enjoy it like you do. Question, I'm sorry. What's the ring? The ring doorbell. Oh, okay. When you said the ring, yeah. Maybe. Sometimes they take the ring doorbell. Yeah, so the ring doorbell, if the ring doorbell is installed in the house, that should stay, right? But you need to have access. The buyer needs to be able to use that ring doorbell and access. So what software are you using for it? What is it? That needs to transfer to the buyer. Can't just leave stuff there and let the buyer figure it out. That's not how it works. It says in the contract you need to provide access to that stuff. Paragraph D is for B and C. The following improvements and accessories will be retained by the seller. It will not convey. One question, another question. What if they don't have the remotes for the garage? Then they would go buy them. So um, the following improvements that must be retained by the seller and must be removed prior to delivery of possession. So the exclusion paragraph is for B and C. B and C says these items must convey. Paragraph D says, no, I, I, Karen, I'm going to put my house for sale, but I want to exclude the water softener. 
I want to exclude the brackets in the media room and the family room. That's where I put that in here. Quick question. I have a client that has a sink that's installed mm -hmm. in the garage. It's like attached to the house. Uh-huh. He wants to take it with him. There's a process to have it for me. Yeah. I put in the garage. So, so the question is, there's a built-in safe in the garage. Is it built into the concrete? I don't know. Some are built into the concrete. Some will be, they literally yes. dug up the concrete in the floor yes. and put a concrete in. So that's considered built in, right? It's built in the concrete. So that's something if he wants to take, he has to exclude it out, right? However, when you do that, you're gonna leave a hole in the floor. So how are you gonna fix that? Can't just leave a hole in the floor. So you gotta fill it in. Can't just leave a big old gaping hole in the wall. You gotta fill it in, All right? You legally can't leave it or it's just not a good practice to leave it? The hole in the floor? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously you shouldn't, but I mean, like people want to sell their home as is, especially in markets like this or like- so if they exclude it out of here, right? And I'm a buyer's agent and I see the safe is built in the floor and they're excluding it. I'm going to have to put it in my contract if it's not addressed and done beforehand that the concrete needs to be filled in and taken care of. Same thing if I see they're removing stuff, that's why you disclose it. Then as the buyer's agent, I'm gonna put patch and paint, paint to match. You know what I mean? So as a buyer's agent, you have to be aware of that. But if I'm the listing agent, I'm going to school my seller. They're going to ask for it in the contract. So you might as well get it done now. Because I want to market your home to the broader market, not the narrow. So I'm going to eliminate a bunch of people. If they see a hole in the ground, they're not going to want to do it. So do you want to eliminate those people or let's let's go ahead and those kinds of things is something you want to do before it debuts up in the listing. It's going to hurt them. It's going to turn away buyers. It's going to hurt them in pricing. It's going to hurt them in the market. It's your job to educate them. Don't do that. It's going to hurt you. Where do solar panels fall? So solar panels, if they're being leased, and then it's going to be part of um, the one to four family where it's going to be part of a leasing accessory that has to go. It is part of like an accessory um, that would probably have to, that stays with the house. If it's free and clear or if it's a lease and it has those things, it's going to be, have to be disclosed and turned over to the buyer. And that's part of the one to four family. So I would educate them that that's an accessory is it paid for in cash? Do you have a loan on it? If they have a loan on it, obviously the, the loan has to be paid off with the proceeds of sale. This way the buyer gets it free and clear, right? We give the buyer the property free and clear of what? All encumbrances. So can't give them a home free and clear and then give them equipment and accessories stuck with a lien on it. it doesn't work that way. <laughs> what is the normal timeline? Um, like so the question is what's the timeline and we take a listing and then we need to get it active on the market so the seller can take their leisure time in getting things up and running um we have we're going to get to the next section where we're going to go ahead and put that time in so let's go wait for the next paragraph E says the property is in an HOA. Three is the listing price. This we give them a CMA for, right? And part of our requirements here in compliance for you guys to get paid is the CMA must be initialed by the seller. So when I'm taking this listing, I have it signed. I have the CMA I presented to them when I had my appointment, if it's not the same night. And I have a second one that I'm going to have them initial because that has to come back with me because it has to be uploaded into your opportunity. The CMA must be initialed by the seller. You're not going to get a paycheck unless you have it in there. 
begin the listing now. You can't do anything without a signed listing agreement. So the listing begins the night that you sit down with them. A typical term is a six month listing. If the seller isn't happy with your services, you should go ahead and terminate them out. We don't have a seller service guarantee. A lot of brokerages do, but you can offer that. Mr. and Mrs. Seller, if any time you're not happy with my services, we can go ahead and terminate the contract. So we should let them, we should tell them that. If they're hemming and hawing about that. That's a business decision you make. Back here is the commissions, the broker compensation. You can offer, uh, you can ask the, you can charge 6%, 7%, whatever it is that you wanna charge, that number goes in here. If at any time you wanna discount this, please see me um, or Kristen or Mary, so this way we know what you're discounting. If you're an experienced agent, um, we trust that you handle that. But in the very beginning, we want you to see us because um, you can't just give the farm away. We had an agent that put one, literally put 1% in here. Oh, wow. That was a problem. <laughs> so you can't do that, right? You have to charge because this number here goes to also pay the co-op. What is a co-op? The other side. <clears throat> Who's the selling agent? The other side. Co-op and selling agent are one and the same. You are the listing agent. Earned, commissions are earned when we come to an agreement to exchange, agree to sell the property and it's payable once it closes. Breach under contract. If the seller collects earnest money, then at some point in time, if we're owed money, we can collect that money from his earnest money. We really rarely practice that. But what I try to tell my clients at this juncture is, you are under breach of contract if at any time we are in escrow, you've agreed, to sign a one to four family, you've agreed to sell your property and you change your mind, you are in breach. A seller cannot change his mind. Once he crosses that path, he must be committed to sell, unfortunately. So he must be very, very sure before he signs a contract to sell his home that he indeed wants to sell. If he's not sure that job promotion is gonna come through, he's not sure that relocation is gonna come through. Do not have him sign an agreement to sell. Because he will be made to sell and vacate his home, period. We had a seller who decided um, one day after he signed a, an agreement to purchase that he, he didn't want to sell because his employer told him, we're not transferring you. Guess what? That was one day, one day into a 30 day escrow. He couldn't get out of it, had to get attorneys. It cost him $45,000 to stay in his home. Wow. He paid everybody's commissions and everybody's attorney's fees. So once they make a commitment to sell, they have to sell. Other fees and reimbursable expenses. We really frown upon you charging other fees and reimbursable expenses. Some agents will charge if you terminate early, you pay for my photography, or there's a cancellation fee. It's a business decision you do, but you do that with caution. The brokerage cannot help you out on this. There's TREC and RESPA, severe guidelines, severe penalties, and suspension if this is done incorrectly. RESPA says, if you're gonna charge a fee or you want to be reimbursed for an expense, it should be something that was outside the scope that you normally would collect for your commissions or you would normally do for commissions. 
Because if you're not going to collect commissions for that task, then why should you collect an extra expense for that task? So you have to keep receipts and show and prove that you did this, you know, and um, it's an expense to you and you need to get reimbursed for it. Photography is one of those that you can get away with. Pretty much anything else, if you say, well, I'm just charging a termination fee and RESPA audits you, RESPA is going to say, what did this fee go to? Show me receipts and proof if the consumer files a truck complaint against you. So I caution you to see if it's really worth it. And then we can't collect it for you. If you do terminate the contract and you call Mr. Seller, Mr. Seller, you know, you owe me $450 and he says, I don't want to pay you. We can't collect it for you. We're not going to do that. So how can you collect that money? You have to hire an attorney or you take them to civil court. I don't know, is that worth your time? And then what's the consequence? You piss the consumer off and all they have to do is go on social media and start bad mouthing and you know, complaining and whining about it on social media. And then you're pretty much toast after that. So I'd be very cautious as to how important it is for you to charge other fees and expenses. I've seen this go wrong more than I've seen it go right. So I would just caution you on that. Protection period. Yeah, I always put, for me, my business decision is I put NA. And I tell them, I said, I don't charge you any fees or expenses if we need to terminate the contract. Terminate the listing. Excuse me, terminate the listing. Protection period. This means starting, means that time starting the day after this listing ends and continues for 90, 120, 180, whatever you wanna put in there, days. Sell means any transfer of any fee simple interest in the property, whether by oral or written agreement or option. So this protects us during this period. How to understand this very easy. If during the listing, I bring, I procure a buyer to the property and the buyer is very interested, but the seller tells me, I want to terminate. I don't want to sell anymore. I just, or I don't like your services. I, I don't like you. I'm not comfortable with you. I want to terminate this. Okay, fine. I terminate. But the next day, the buyer reaches out to him and they want to all of a sudden sell the property and work with each other. Guess what? They're going to owe me money. They're going to owe the brokerage commissions. That's what that means. And I explain it to the consumer just like that. Is that if, if the seller hires another agent? The broker, yeah. And it, then that goes away. So it it's, away. yep. Mm -hmm. So the buyer in this case, three days later, the new seller, new listing, you don't get commission. No. So then it goes on to say if they go ahead and list with another brokerage, that this paragraph is no longer in play. If there's a and then the sellers want to terminate, can they or no? We, we don't want you terminating the listing until we terminate that escrow. So what we would do is we'll, we'll say, okay, Mr. Seller, I understand if this contract doesn't go through and we bust out, you want to terminate the listing. So I'll do an amendment to the listing, but I'll extend it out till after the close date of that contract. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Never see it happen. Had the question asked, but never seen that happen. County, this should be where the property is located or where the closing will occur, or where your market center is located. We like for you to just have in there Fort Bend County, because that's where our market center is located. Escrow authorization, seller authorizes and broker may so instruct any escrow or closing agent authorized to close a transaction for the purpose or acquisition of the property to collect and disperse to broker all amounts payable to broker under this listing. 
We cannot collect commissions directly from the seller. Believe it or not, I've had this asked and I've had this try to be done. Commissions need to go to the title company and then the title company pays us. As realtors, can you be handling money? No, commissions are between the seller and the broker. Once this agreement is signed, can you use the, the commissions to negotiate a contract? No. Once this agreement is signed, the seller has agreed to pay the broker X amount. If you change that, you have to amend the listing. Listing services. This is very, very important. We've had a lot of agents getting fined over this in the last couple months, and we're really trying to get you guys to understand. If the property is publicly marketed, MLS rules require, MLS, HAR rules require that the broker file this listing with multiple listing services within one business day. Public marketing includes, but not limited to, flyers in a window, yard signs, digital marketing on public facing websites, our forum, your Facebook, your Instagram, brokerage websites, digital communications, emails, texting, multiple multi-brokerage listing sharing networks, our intranet, our back agent, and other applications available to the public. That is public marketing. So sign in the order, coming soon on it, that 14 days can apply. Exactly because you put it on the MLS. And could only be in that status for 14 days. So here's the rule. When you take this listing, when your seller signs this, you have three days to get it into the MLS system, period. If you're not going to do that because he needs to get the home ready, you need photography, then you're gonna mark this one B. And when you do that, that triggers the HAR 300 form. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Why is that okay? Well, it's not okay. They're in violation, but it's the physical sign violation. Somebody would have had to turn them in. HAR is not, doesn't have people driving around. The rule is on the MLS. It's in there for 14 days. So he might have changed it on MLS, but didn't okay. drive to take his own sign off the line. So if you wanted to be a realtor to turn him in, you could have turned him into HAR police. And so they would have sent somebody out. But um, you know, the rule is it has to be changed in the status on the, on HAR. So everybody knows the rule. If I have my client sign tonight, I'm gonna, to, Mr. Marcel, we're gonna sign this listing agreement tonight. That's gonna to allow me to go ahead and do my job. But we're required to go active in three days and I know you're not ready. I, I need to get photography, you need to clean out. So when would be a good time? Do you think you, we can go live? And they're gonna tell me, I need 10 days, I need four. They're gonna ask me, well, how long do you need for photography? I'm gonna say two days. How long do you need for cleaning? I need a week. So you plan it, you have your calendar in front of you. So you plan 10 days, 14 days. When I, when I check this box, this tells me I need my HAR 300, period. Yeah. Uh, on the, the three-day uh, MLS rule, the day you sign the listing. So, and what about the weekend? So, just it's three calendar days, days, including the day of sunset. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What is so, oh, <laughs> so, um, if baby, if we need to get uh, photographs and get the, I guess with the sign coming soon. If you're going to be within 14 days. If if you're you're 21 days out, 
right? Then you can only have coming soon for 14 days. So you need to time that, you know. But you're saying that if we have a listing agreement signed, we have to put it, or if I do the HR 300, then I have those 14 days to put coming soon. If you're not gonna put it live, you need the HR 300. And I can put coming soon with that. And then you can adhere you know, you don't have to put it live till this date. If you want to start talking about it and pre-marketing in it, then within the 14 day window of you going live, you could go coming soon. My question was, if, if that was in a case scenario, let's say it's a scenario where someone wants to sell their house, but they're buying new construction and maybe the timeline doesn't fit for them to go on the market right now. Mm -hmm. Do you? And you can extend that out with this paragraph. You, so you just say mm -hmm. within that paragraph the date that you would attend on, whether it be yes. three mm -hmm. months out. This could now, be 30 or days or 60 days, whatever that may be. And then we're going to look at the HAR 300 where you're going to put that in as well. Because here's the reasoning. This contract is a contract between who? Broker. Broker. The broker and the seller. You, Mr. Realtor, are a member of the Houston Association of Realtors. So you have to adhere to those rules. HAR doesn't know what you signed, but if they get audited and we get audited, they're gonna say that we took a listing, why wasn't it on the MLS for everybody to know about it? For fair housing. Well, then you are secretly holding a listing. It's called a pocket listing, off-market listing. Well, that's a violation of fair housing. Once I have something that's for sale, I have to tell the world it's for sale at the same time. If I'm not doing that, I'm what? I'm withholding that. So HAR says our rule is three days. The Texas Association of Realtors rule is five days. That's why it says in here, five days after the date this listing begins, seller authorizes broker to submit information about this listing to the MLS. That's because this is a statewide form. So the state says you have five days, but what if I, I'm in San Antonio, I'm in Houston, we belong to Houston, Houston says three days, that supersedes the state. If I'm in San Antonio, theirs is two days. <clears throat> no, you don't need to do that. It says the broker will file this listing with one or more listing services by the earlier of the time required by the MLS rules or five days. So you could just say, Mr. Seller, the Houston Association of Realtors requires me to have this up in three days. You're talking about that and you all know, I mean, it's gonna be common sense. Can you do it in three days? Mr. Mr. Seller, I'm required to get this live in three days. Can you do it? No. And then you're gonna, 90% of the time we're marking this box. Or, once in a blue moon, maybe twice, three times in your career, you'll have where the seller does not want it on the MLS at all. Broker will not file this listing with any multiple listing services. Again, if you mark that box, it triggers the HAR 300. And it goes on to further explain to the seller, if that's the case, then you understand, Mr. Seller, the property will not be publicly marketed. It would not be included in the MLS database and yada, yada, yada. So it's just really important. Just know if you're not going in live in three days, what do you need to do? HAR 300, period, that's it. Coming soon is a different circumstance. Coming soon is a status. Once you start marketing it, you're getting close to the end. You get within the 14 days of it going live. I can get my sign on. I can start publicly talking about it.
incoming student status because it's confusing. So when it's incoming student status in the MLS, it can be there for 14 days, and it has to go live or withdraw. You can publicly market it incoming soon? Yep. That's when you can. That's when you can. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Okay. But not with that, not with a sign in the yard. Yeah, with a sign in, coming soon is you could put a sign on the yard. You could start talking about it. It's coming soon. You're going to put your sign out there with a rider coming soon. Okay. Allows you to do that pre marketing stuff. You can't show it. Can't show it. But you can talk about it, get your sign on the lawn. Other, well, they kind of, it's, I think it's other agents sort of in your, well, no, coming soon. No, you can, there's two separate. Coming soon status on the MLS, it's only to other brokerages. The public can't see that. So you can talk about it amongst the brokerage and all of that. Um, the public does not see that coming soon status on the MLS. It's for us to allow the other brokerages the opportunity to know it's coming. So any previous leads we may have had in the neighborhood, we cannot market to them or let them know that's in the coming soon. Um, you can, you just can't show it. It's coming soon. I can't show it to you, but it's coming soon. So we can do a Facebook post that's coming soon? Coming soon, yes. And just as long as like if we start doing that, we have 14 days to actually has to go live. Okay. You can describe the property. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can talk about it. Mm -hmm. That rule is based on the new law, clear cooperation. We have to cooperate with everybody and treat everybody fairly and just. Where you will get in trouble is if you start showing it to one or two people and they write an offer and then you put it coming soon and it goes pended. And if somebody wants to file a complaint against you, Trek's gonna audit you and say, why did you show it to these people? You weren't allowed to show it. You violated fair housing. Everybody needed an opportunity, the same as these two folks to see this property. And everybody needed to have an opportunity to put an offer in. So you cannot execute a contract when it's a coming soon status, period. Even if it's a site on scene cash. Gotta wait till you go active. No, property cannot be shown. You have to give everybody fair access at the same time. Um, rentals, do we have coming soon? Yes, it'd be the same thing if you're coming soon on a rental lease, lease uh, listing, lease listing. Can't prove, you know, can't prove what they did or whatever the case yeah. may be, but fair housing means we need to give everybody the same opportunity. A separate form. Yes, uh -huh. we're going to go through it right after this. Authorizing access. You want to make sure the seller understands, Mr. Seller, I'm not the only one that's going to have access to your property. Appraisers, inspectors, and contractors such as sign companies or whatever, they have access sometimes, super key access, their membership members to the HAR. So they'll have access to your property too. But those are made by appointments. I'll know who's coming on the property. I'll make sure that appointment's scheduled and everybody will be registered into my super box. And I, I take this time to educate the seller that we're going to have an inspection period, an option period. We have to allow the buyer access to the property. I've had so many cases where the listing agent was just adamant, well, I let them in once, they don't need to come in again. That's wrong. If they have a 10 day option period, that buyer can come through that house every day. You have to allow them access to do what they need to do. I get it needs to be reasonable, it needs to be convenient, but you cannot block access to the property during those times. 
So make sure you facilitate that properly. And they educate and they're un they understand that. Scheduling companies, we use showing time here at Keller Williams. You want to get sure, log on to your showing time account, get to know showing times. Showing times are scheduling company. They coordinate appointments. I sell this to my client and I say, we use showing time. Not every brokerage uses it. This is a benefit to you, Mr. Seller, because you have a professional company scheduling appointments. You're going to have your own access to see feedback. You'll get a weekly report of who of um, the activity on your home. So you can keep track of who's coming in and out. You're going to be able to customize times and showings that fit you if you have a birthday party, anniversary party. We can block out times. I sell the service. So you want to know the service yourself so you could sell it to the seller. Key box, I explained to them there's going to be an electronic box. Again, this is another service that you sell. If there is a tenant on the property, the tenant, there's a form the tenant must sign to authorize um, access to the property. Cooperation with other brokerages. This is where we pay our co-op. The other half, Mr. Seller, the commissions to our company is 6%. I'm going to pay three to the selling brokerage, the brokerage I'm gonna cooperate with. Oh, sorry, um, in number two, if, it's, if the property is leased, if the property is occupied by the owner, that's not needed. Number two, if tenant occupies the property at any time during the listing, the seller will furnish broker a written statement signed by all tenants authorizing the use of the key box. So if there's a tenant living in the property, we must have this form signed by the tenant that they okay us to put the lockbox on. But if it's the owner? He's not a tenant, right? No, only a tenant. A human being that has a lease, they don't own the property. They don't, there's no ownership, they're, they're leasing it, has to sign. Intermediary, this explains to the seller how um, the broker may show the property to interested prospective buyers who the broker represents. So I explain this, Mr. Seller, I mark this box because you wanna allow me or anybody at my brokerage to bring a buyer through and show the home. I represent you. If at any time that buyer wants to write an offer, I'll ask you if you're comfortable with me representing both, or would you like my broker to assign the prospect or the buyer to somebody else? And I'll go ahead and explain that there's a conflict of interest when one real estate agent can represent both parties. Is that a conflict of interest? One real estate agent representing both parties. It's a huge conflict of interest. I'm promising to get the seller the most amount of money for his home in the shortest amount of time. I'm promising to keep all the information he tells me confidential. I'm promising to do my due diligence to bring a qualified buyer through those doors. With the buyer, the buyer has no promises. The buyer has a fiduciary by the state of Texas that says, I should treat that person fairly and impartially. But if he signs a buyer's rep agreement, then now I owe all those same promises I promised this person, the seller, to this person. How can you make the same promise to two people? You can't. Then you have to take away those promises and say, all right, I'm just gonna be a facilitator. I'm just gonna facilitate the paperwork. I'll present you both the paperwork. 
I'll read you verbatim what it says. Don't ask me any advice. If you have a question, you got to hire an attorney. That may work for some cases. Will it work for most? Absolutely not. It's a business decision you make, but it's one that I see most often again, not go well. <laughs> I see most often in times uh, a realtor will say, I will never ever do that again. You'll do it once, but you'll never do it again. Confidential during this listing or after it ends, broker may not knowingly disclose information obtained in confidence from the seller. Broker may not disclose to seller any confidential information regarding any other person the broker represents or previously represented, except as required by law. This paragraph's important. Broker is authorized to market the property with the following options, conventional VA, FHA, cash, Texas bidder, and land loan. I explained to the seller, I wanna market your home to the broader market. So we wanna advertise this home to as many different buyers as possible. So we're gonna welcome these different types of financing. When we get an offer though, we'll research the type of financing that they are doing and we'll evaluate the numbers and we'll decide whether that offer is gonna work for you or not. If any one of these are charging you a fee, we'll work that into the offer price. Skipping right along, section 12. These are seller's representations. These are very important that you run these through with the seller and say, Mr. Seller, are you delinquent on any loans, any financial uh, obligations? Are you, do you have any liens or encumbrances? Are you aware of any judgments that was um, put against you or your spouse at any point in time? Are you dealing with a relocation company that we need to pay? You owe a referral fee to anybody. Are you in good standing with your HOA? All of those need to be told to you up front. Why? It's gonna affect the closing. So you need to schedule, you know, either meetings with the title company or meetings with attorneys accordingly. These are seller's promises. And I run through these and I say, Mr. Seller, you promised not to rent the property without letting me know, not to negotiate with a prospective buyer on your own. I tell them if somebody knocks on your door, there's a stack of my business cards to have them call me. I further explain, you really don't wanna be answering your door to strangers or people off the street. It's not even safe these days to do that. I also explain to them they have to maintain any pool equipment and those things. I explain they have to maintain the house, keep your lawn mowed, pool taken care of. And I also explain to him, I, if at any time we are listed or during the escrow process and an event occurs, your daughter flushes the Barbie doll down the toilet and the toilet explodes. We have a hail storm and we have a roof leak. Something happens. You have to let me know. We have to amend your seller's disclosure. And if we're in escrow, we have to let the buyer and that party know. So at any time, any event occurs on the property, you are required to amend all applicable notices and disclosures. It says it right here in the listing. B, this is a very important paragraph to, to discuss during hurricane season. And now we have to worry about freezing in a winter season here. <laughs> Who knew? We're in a tropical climate, but now we have to worry about winter freezing. So, so it says broker is not responsible or liable in any manner for personal injury to any person or for loss or damage to any person's real or personal property resulting from any act or omission not caused by the broker's ne negligence, including but not limited to the injuries or damages caused by other brokers, their associates, inspectors, appraisers, or contractors. I had two in one week. Um, I had an inspector fall through the ceiling. 
uh, during inspection and we had a consumer fall through the ceiling in the garage during inspection one week, last week, two weeks ago. So we're not, we're talking about sellers, not buyers, but don't have your buyer go through the attic and walk in the attic. That's what they hire an inspector for. Don't do it. Inspector, inspector yeah, inspector fell through. But inspector has insurance, right? So the inspector had to go ahead and pay for that. He had to hire a contractor, get it out, get it done within days. Because the buyer wasn't going to continue to buy the house. And if he does, well, he did in this case. But if he doesn't continue to buy the house, the seller has to still continue to sell the house, right? So all that stuff needs to be tended to immediately. And it's your job to facilitate that in a very expedient, efficient manner. Um, freezing water pipes, dangerous conditions on the property, anything of those sort, the broker's not responsible, the seller is responsible for those or the person that caused the issue is responsible for that question. Oh, um, so that would be a material change if the person <clears throat> talked through, so do they have to bring it to the seller and the broker? So in the one case where it was the consumer, um, and in that case, they didn't, they terminated the contract and they didn't go through with it. Yeah, it, it, they, they should go ahead, you know, and, and let them know, well, somebody went through the ceiling, you know, and uh, it's been taken care of and repaired and, and those kinds of things. If you can't really see it and it's not noticeable and everything was put back to it and he's, you know, moving on, it, it should be fine, you know? you don't really have to disclose that to the next buyer coming in, but the buyer coming in and it's in the process of being repaired and they see what's going on and there's a hole there. Yeah, you gotta tell them what happened, right? Kind of common sense on those things, right? Seller agrees to protect, defend, indemnify and hold the broker harmless for many damage costs and attorney fees and expenses that are caused by the seller arise from the seller's failure or caused by seller giving incorrect information. He lies, do, does any of those things, we, we're, we're indemnified from any of that. Attorney's fees, the prevailing party will go ahead and seek the losing party to cover those attorney's fees. In that case where the seller decided to walk away, part of his problem paying so much money, he's had to pay everybody's attorney's fees, right? Section 19, this is all the addenda that gets attracted, gets attached to, oh, are you taking, no, she's saying, <laughs> I don't like the pals, I know. Okay, yes, I'm gonna ignore you. Notices between the parties must be in writing and are effective when sent to the receiving party's address or email address. So when we have to give somebody notice, we have to put it in writing in an email and send it off to their email. Foreign person, you have to explain to the seller, if you purchase this property as a foreign person, when you sell it, you're gonna to have to pay the IRS taxes. If they say to you, yes, I'm foreign, great. Let me contact you with the title office. You let the title company handle it. If he says, I don't know, great. I'm gonna have my escrow officer call you and she'll explain. Amendment to the listing. If we have to amend anything on the listing, here's the amendment to do so. If something happens to the seller, they're sick, they're ill, and they need to temporarily shut down the listing. They don't want people coming through. You can withdraw it off the market for any extended amount of time. So that way they can tend to and take care of. We have this a lot with people getting sick and ill. That's okay. Here is your mud district form. This is the second most important document in the listing. There's three places on here that mandates you must provide this notice to the buyer prior to execution of a binding contract. 
It is also in three different disclosures to the buyer and on the one to four family. So that tells you this is what? Pretty dang important. This is your mud form. Notice to a purchaser of real property in a water district. We have specific classes on this on how to get that information. I just want you to know this is what it looks like. This is a very important document and you have to provide it to the buyer before the contract. Prior to contract. So when you're handing the seller's disclosure, when you're in negotiations, this must be given to the buyer. Yes. Has it. This gets uploaded into the MLS along with your seller's disclosure and your T47. You, just because it's uploaded to MLS, you can't, that's not giving, that's not giving to a party where they could say they received it. You need to make sure that the agent has it. And how you know that is when they send you off for an, an offer. If somebody's gonna send me an offer, I said, please send me the mud and the, um, along with your HOA and along with seller's disclosure. This way I know your clients looked at it and seen it. Sorry. Here's your HAR 300. Good. And at the very bottom, we tell HAR when we're gonna go public. Regarding the mud disclosure, where do they get most of the information? The seller doesn't have it. Yeah, so there's a class on that. I don't have the sites with me to tell you where to go, but there we have specific sites so that's going to tell us in what mud district. You find the mud district on the tax. The mud district number is on their tax records. Then from there, there's the mud bond information under realist tax that we use to fill this in. That's the easiest way. Or there's other websites you can go to, which Lorraine recommends you do. I say it's okay to get the mud district off the tax, then go to mud bond information under realist. It has all of this information in there and you fill it in. That's the quickest, easiest, most efficient way. Here's your HAR 300. At the very bottom is when we tell HAR when you're gonna go live. This should match the sentence that you filled out on B2 in the listing agreement. The seller has to sign, I have to sign, and you, the listing agent, has to sign it. And then it gets submitted to HAR. It's your job to do that. Non-realty items. We use this document for the refrigerator, washer, dryer, non-realty stuff, stuff that doesn't convey with the house, the pool table, the bar stools, any of those things. And it says to specify each item carefully, include the description, model number, serial numbers, location, and any other information. You wanna make sure that what the buyer thought she was getting, she'll be getting. Question, Karen, if, let's say they, they have these items that are non real items, they're leaving it, them there, but the buyer doesn't want them. The buyer does, if the buyer doesn't want these items, the seller must take them. You can't just leave them in the, this is personal property. This is like leaving trash. So if you're not gonna leave your kitchen trash bag, you're not gonna leave these items. It's personal belongings. Just like you don't leave drawer full of underwear, you're not gonna leave these things. It's the same, one in the same. The seller wants to leave them. So as the seller's agent, we have to, who does this? The buyer or we do it? If the seller it. says he wants to leave it, then you can advertise, hey, there's a perk. The seller is willing to leave these. If the buyer says, I don't want that, the seller has to remove it. If it's a plus, then you market it as an extra perk, turnkey. If you're leaving a fridge, washer, and dryer in good working order, then you advertise it, hey, turnkey, this is a freebie for you. If they're non-working and they're junky, then it's considered junk and trash. You need to take it away. 
So if the seller wants to leave it to the buyer, does it want it? Can you take it? Um, it, it yeah, it's personal property. So if the seller says, I don't want this, but hey, if you want it, you, know, you can you can take it and remove it. Uh-huh, then you can remove it. You remove it before the walkthrough, before closing, so the buyer doesn't have to deal with it. Yeah, if the seller wants to leave you personal property, you can take it. They don't have to like sign anything. The addendum is not needed for something else. No, yeah. this is just for stuff personal property that the most of the time the buyer negotiates that they want these things notice of seller's termination of contract this is when the seller wants to give notice that he needs to terminate the contract and there's only really a couple of times this will come into play this is frequently used when the buyer has not delivered the earnest money in time. How many days does the buyer have to deliver earnest money? Three days. Three days. So if it doesn't get there and the seller sends us over to the title company and wants to terminate, guess what? The title company will term, you know, the, the, uh, the contract can be terminated. That is a, that's a speed of who gets there first. This has to get to the title company before the earnest money does and the seller can then terminate the contract. We would send this for the seller or the seller sends this form to the seller? The seller is gonna tell you, I wanna terminate this contract. You're gonna give this to him, have him sign it and then send it over to the title company. So this usually is used to, um, deal with the earnest money type situation. And then there might be other paragraphs of the contract that pertain to him being able to terminate. You would just cite what other paragraphs and the one to four addenda apply. Short sale addendum. This will probably be coming to play in our marketplace next year sometime. This is when a seller doesn't have enough proceeds to sell his house and um, to avoid foreclosure, he is asking his lien holder for the permission to short sale the home, meaning he doesn't have enough proceeds to pay everything off. The lender has to agree to sell it for less money that's owed. I'm almost done. And then the lead-based paint disclosure and then there's, here's your intermediary where we'll state who represents the owner, who, who represents the prospect. And then notice of information from other sources. This is where we will state if the seller has anything in particular receipts and stuff that we need to pass on to the buyer, that we're gonna go ahead and put that information in here. This, this information came from the seller. We're passing it along to you, Mr. Buyer. So this is a must. If you have information that the seller has that, that we need to pass on. And then our estimated net proceeds. You can get this in your finance section in HAR, or I'm giving you all a app, title snap. You go into app and um, look for apps. You wanna look for title snap. That will give you a net sheet for your seller. Title snap. Snap. I have two more documents. Seller's invitation to buy to buyer to submit a new offer. This is that your seller gets multiple offers. We do not want to counter one. We want to offer an invitation for everybody to submit a new offer. And um, this avoids us being in a counter situation. So I'm going to um, refresh your memory on real estate 101. When we counter offer somebody, we have to finish those negotiations. If I start talking to somebody, I, I say, I accept your terms, except I wanna counter this or that. Then I have now established a situation for the seller where we have to entertain this one party and I need to conclude those negotiations either by moving forward or terminating that out 
and then I could start negotiations with somebody else. Once I do that, I hold my seller up. We can look at all offers, but I need to entertain one at a time if I start countering. I need to conclude my negotiations with this guy and move on. If I don't want to put my seller in that situation, I do a seller's invitation to buyer to submit new offer. Not like highest and best. Highest and best. You can put in here the terms that are of best interest of the highest interest to the seller in here and allow everybody to resubmit their offer. There is a seller's notice to remove contingency under a backup offer if you do that. I'll, I'll go into that later on. The T47, I would suggest as a best business practice as a listing agent to have the title company handle this. And then the last one is termination of listing. So in a T47, if they do not have a survey, they know they don't have a survey listing. Is the T47 required? Um, no, if they don't have a survey attached, you do not require the T47. The survey and T47 are like Siamese twins. They can't be separated. They go together. That's a great question for the next class. <laughs> yes, T boards and surveys starting at noon. So, yeah, so then the last thing is the seller's disclosure. You do not fill that out for the seller, the seller fills that out. You want to make sure he has the correct HOA information in there and then discloses if he has the survey attached or not. So we did it. That concludes everything. How are you guys there on Zoom? We've got 12 of you on there. Any questions? We have our, sir, uh, we have our title company here ready. We're going to roll right into survey and T47, which is perfect because that's where we left off. Karen, for those that are on Zoom, we never got the documents in chat. Okay. They were, um, I put them in in the beginning. So sometimes in chat, um, I'm gonna upload it now. So for you guys who are on Zoom, if you wanna stay, are you okay if I keep the Zoom up and running and they can hear? So for you guys on Zoom, I'm gonna keep this open so you can listen. Are we all eating sushi? No, I don't know, what's for lunch? Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A in the house for the, you Zoomers. We've got Chick-fil-A. Yeah. Karen. Mm -hmm. Karen's going to help you get it all set up. So get lunch, guys, and come back in. Yeah. And Rita's going to tell you all about T47s and surveys. Hi, Miss Karen. How are you? Hi, I'm awesome. I so for that. those of us on okay, Zoom. Okay, so contracts covering still in the chat. Okay, wait, hold on, you guys. I'm going to go ahead and upload this stuff for you. I had to see them already. Karen. Okay, so here's the sample listing contracts. And then um, you'll want um, the PowerPoint that I just used, right? So let me get that up. Okay, you all should have it. And then if you can't open it or something, just email me. So um, are you, do you have- um, I have the PowerPoint okay. up and ready. Do you want me to just email it to you and pull it up on your- um, Sure, maybe that'll be good. This way I can keep them on. still here, yeah. I have a quick question, if you don't mind. Um, so you guys in Zoom, do you wanna just take two minutes, five minutes and go to the restroom? And because um, I want you to stay on for the survey and I see there's 13 of you on here. There's probably a couple more of you coming in just for our survey class. So stand by, because I'm gonna upload the PowerPoint for our survey class. So y'all in Zoom, go take five minutes. 
a quick question. Thank you for the, coming to class. Is the showing nice time a requirement? She wanted to know if I could do this. Apparently, I can't do it with my phone. Do what? Uh, the QR back there. Oh, OK. That's OK. Did you sign the sheet? That, I have a sheet that went around. Well, I have. I've done it up until yeah, the, well, the second one. I didn't do yeah, I'll give them the registration. Yeah, that's okay. Miss Karen, what is your email? Karen Clements, E M E N T S, at kw.com. Oh, no. I'm sure you I just sent it. Are there separate handouts for the survey? Class? There is no handout. There's will, no handout. No, oh, okay. I will um, digitally send it to you guys because uh, it's a PowerPoint. So if you would like me to, once we're done, I can email it over to you. Hi. Oh, okay. Yes. Yes. No problem. Uh -huh. the weekend. Hi, Alice. Yes. <laughs> and um, I have five authors. So congratulations. Thank you. Oh. So after this class, can you help me? Like, yeah, figure out what to do. And sure, stuff. absolutely. Because I we know which offer we want to accept, and so I just need to know what all to do. And okay, to do properly and legally. And yes, 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 yes. I would love to help you. you. Sure. All right, I'm waiting to hear an answer. Um, Questions? Yeah. Uh, okay. Question on Zoom. Yeah. Go ahead. Who had that question? Did one of you on Zoom have a question for me? I think Mr. Lango had a question. I have a question which might be similar to his. Is the showing time a re that we were required to use showing time in order to coordinate the showings of the homes? I, I couldn't hear. What was that? Are we required to use showing time um, to, to coordinate the showings of the homes or is that an option? Um. It's part of your services here. Um, I don't know if you can opt out for that. I would probably ask the girls in accounting and marketing. Um, I mean, I'd like Nanny to use it, no or, question about it, but I mean, just, I'm just kind of learning, so, okay. Yeah. Karen, I have a question. Uh-huh. So if a buyer uh, fails to deliver the earnest money within the three days, and if the seller wants to extend that for another day or two so is that allowed or that would be a breach? yes you just do an amendment i got it amendment yes do okay. an amendment this way it's in writing that he needs to wait for that to get there okay so because you don't want him changing his mind and then um and then the poor buyers out of luck, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, and then you can just click and through. Perfect. So I'll give you my machine, machine. to send this message. So everybody, this is Marita from Fidelity National Title. She brought us our lummy, yummy lunch for today. Of course. And um, I was very strategic in making sure I coordinated this with the lesson you learned today because it all ties together. Uh, you being the listing agent. So Marita, thank you so very of course. much. Thank you so much for having me. And we'll give um, a couple more minutes for our potty breaks and our lunch. And then we'll you okay sitting started. there or do you want the podium? Oh, no, there? I'm fine. I will okay. stand. Okay. Yes, okay. no, I'm good. Okay. I'm good. Thank you so uh -huh. much. Yeah. And their daughter is about her house. What do you put in that? So you can't do anything until it gets probated. Okay. And until the judge decrees that she can do so. You have that judge decree or you have it in a trust. So as long as you have paperwork that says you can do 
do that? Yeah, all right. Because um, we will have to have that person on from the time pass, allowing us to go ahead and yeah. the market to sell it. We want to make sure that we do that, right? So, the most important thing that the title company will not be able to convey to the registration board unless they have proof that this person can sell this house for a different power to do so. And before we do any sort of presentation, how do we confirm that? Did everybody sign in and register in that's here? I am perfect. Thank you so much. Are you guys seeing this crazy market get a little cooled off or are you seeing it just maintain as crazy as ever? It look feels at all the people in here. I know, look at this. I'm starting to feel a little pressure and I never feel pressure oh ever. <laughs> My class is not nearly as long as Miss Karen's class. So, um, yeah, for those of us. <laughs> That's good to know. <laughs> yes, it's not nearly as long, but it is just as um, informative as important. However, we have ne not nearly as many slides, I'm sure, as Miss Karen had. What time did y'all get started with her this morning? Nine. Oh, my. So she had quite the class. Well, that's good for her. <laughs> Very good. Did take a lot out of it? Yeah? All right, you guys ready to get started? My virtual guys, are you guys ready to get started? All right. My name is Marita Okrinsky. I'm with Fidelity National Title. And um, you don't know me. Big on social media. Um, our offices are right down the street. And I always say the difference in every single title company, because in the state of Texas, we are regulated by the state. So it's not like anyone could give you a discount, right? The difference is the human beings behind the scenes that get all of your work done and the relationships and whether you can pick up the phone and give your escrow officer, processor, salesperson a call and ask the questions such as the survey question or a home warranty question. That is really the difference in every single title company in the state of Texas. 
Because as a consumer, at the end of the day, because we are regulated, heavily regulated by the state of Texas, you're going to get the same deal everywhere you go. So we will go ahead and get started with our Survey 101 class. Before I get started, there's a lot in here that I'm going to cover. This is basically like the must know, the you guys need to know for any and all contract purposes, yes. And after we're done with the class, I will email everyone that would like a P the format. I will email it to you, text it to you, however you guys want to get it digitally. That way you can have it and flip through at your convenience. But just like, you know, I'm an immigrant to America and I always say you learn the English language. Every, you never fully learn the English language, right? Like every day you're learning a new word. And just like the English language, title, real estate, you learn something new and something new comes up all the time. So please do not be afraid, even if we're not closing the deal, to give me a call and ask me the question because I am more than happy <coughs> to answer any and all questions. And Fidelity is the number one underwriter in the entire nation. So more than likely, we are probably going to be the one underwriting the deal, even if you're not closing with us at Fidelity National Title. So I'm able to help you a little bit more. So I know Ms. Karen went over this in her contracts class, but where do we find our survey um, information? Trek, page one, and page two, items 6A. Your Trek real estate contract to us as the title company, think of it as an invoice. So when we get your Trek contract, that is basically what we go based off of. Whether your seller has a survey, how long you, you've noted all of this in your contract before it gets to us as the title company. Who's paying for the survey, who's paying for the owner's title policy, the HOA, whatever the cases are, everything on your Trek contract to us as the title company is basically like the invoice. So in this case, this is where you would be no, notating if your seller, if you're on the listing side, has a survey. If so, you know, how long before they have to get it to us or the buyer in order for them to sign the T47? And if not, then who pays for it? Is it our buyer or is it our seller? And that's within how many days do we have to obtain the survey? And here's a myth. Um, a lot of the times what we're finding right now, especially with the market being hotter than ever, um, is that a lot of the um, clients, the end consumers, and even real estate agents are starting to think that we control the pricing on the survey. And I'm sure as you guys have witnessed, surveyors just like appraisers are way back up, right? So their pricing has slightly inflated um, in comparison to what it was last year, just like everything else, right? Everything has increased a little bit. So we have no control as a title company of the pricing for your surveys. We call a surveyor, get the best quote, and in all fairness, we work with specific partners, right? That we typically get the quickest turnaround time. So if you have a survey company, if we're working with one, two, three happy company and you have another one that you would rather use, we are more than happy to give the business to wherever you guys want. Typically speaking, as a real estate agent or as the end consumer, no one really cares or do they really understand where the business goes as long as they get the survey as quickly as possible. But we have no control over the pricing. What's the ballpark price for I'm sorry? What's the ballpark price for a Ballpark price for a typical survey, 475 to 500 is what we're seeing right now. That's a lot in block. Now, if we're going to get fancy schmancy and we're going to look at, you know, if we've got a large farmland that needs boundary meat, that is going to be an additional price. Typically speaking, they charge about $300, the surveyors do. Now, if we've got 10 acres, we actually just had one that was 10 acres, no survey. It was $1,000 in Polk County. That's another thing that you guys have to keep in mind is if it's in these rural counties, the surveyors, although they do cover all the counties in Texas, 254 counties in Texas, the surveyors will charge a little bit more to, as you would, or as I would, right, to go out to those specific counties to do the surveys. Typically speaking though, 475 to 500 is what I would say. So what's a survey coverage? We all know Title 101, Schedule A, Schedule B, Schedule C. Um, our survey coverage is found on Schedule B. And that's basically, it tells us what we're covering. Now, if you have a buyer that is a cash buyer, get this question quite often, do we need a survey? Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. We do not need a survey. We as a title company, can't mandate, right? We can't tell you that you absolutely need a survey. 
However, if your buyer is buying a million dollar house and they're paying cash for it, chances are they're going to want a survey. If they're buying a property that they don't foresee selling or they're just flipping or they're staying in, whatever the case is, they're paying cash, they don't want a survey, they, no one can mandate it. Move. Most of the time, the people that require the surveys are going to be our lenders. But if there's no lender and it's cash, all bets are off. The buyer gets to decide if they want one or not. But the um, in Schedule B, we'll find the coverage, which is the areas. Now, can we close? Another question. Can we close without um, having a proper survey, even if we've got a lender? Yes, if the lender will allow us to close and to without that uninsured survey. So we can close the file. It can be without the survey policy and we can add the survey policy afterwards. We're seeing a lot of hedge funds is where this one is coming. Like they're buying, they're picking up a lot of properties, right? That we know that we're going to get the survey. The surveyors are just really backed up. We know that we're going to get it. We may not get it by tomorrow when the, they want to close. So we'll close the property without in excluding the survey and then we'll get the survey the following you know week whatever the case may be and when we record it with the county it'll be recorded with the survey so the owner's title policy will have the survey in there however we'll close the file just so that we can close and fund for all parties to be happy without it okay so what does the survey need to be um approved so a lot of the times, you know, you guys, you've got a seller that's been in this property for 20 years, let's say, and they have not changed anything to the property. So their survey really is totally approvable, right? We'll send it into our plant. Our plant will look through it, but what do we need? It has to have a date. So we'll go um, line item by line item. It has to be done by a professional, right? Like there has to be a real seal by a surveyor that states, yes, um, this survey was conducted by me and I am a legitimate surveyor company. It has to have the easements, the areas, the utilities, because every survey has this, yes? Even if it's 20 years old, there's chances that it will get approved if nothing has changed. And we can do it the T47. Here's another thing for the T47. We all understand as consumers, right? They're running around and if they're sellers and they, they can't get to a title company, they can't get to their bank, they can't get somewhere to get the T47 notarized. What we're doing is we're doing it virtually. So they get on video, it's a secure link with me, with someone on our team, one of our team members, they sign, they'll show us their ID, they'll sign the T47 virtually, it takes literally five minutes, it's basically a DocuSign signed the T47 virtually so that we can notarize it as the notary. And then the day of closing, so this is at the beginning, yes, when we first get the contract. Now the day of closing, if the survey has been approved and the T47 obviously goes through, then we will have your sellers sign, wet sign the T47 at closing. So that way it's not an inconvenience to your sellers and it will allow for the buyers to continue with the process. And then it also allows the buyer's agent to be okay with that process. Um, the I don't understand why that's important. Because in the one to four family, if you mark box number one, the seller is to provide the survey, go to the T47, it's time is of the essence. You have a certain amount of days to get that done. It doesn't happen. That triggers them to go ahead and buy it, purchase a new one. And you want to make sure that you're adhering to the guidelines. For them to provide that service, helps your ability to compliance and getting it very time. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> and it also, yes, and it doesn't look like that's going to, this virtual life doesn't look like it's going anywhere as of right now. So, and another really great thing with that is because it will alert us to get a new survey or to order a new survey. And depending on what you checked on the contract, it could be a, the, uh, but the seller could be paying for the survey. So it could be an extra cost to your seller, which $500, especially if they're wanting to make as many as much as possible on their proceeds could be a lot. Um, it has to show the directional. So never eat sour watermelon, north, west, south, east. We have to have it on there. Um, encroachments. So part of what we do as a title company. So we are the only insurance on the face of the planet that insures the past and not the future. So part of our jobs is to make sure that on your survey, even if it's an existing survey, 
to make sure that it's there are no encroachments on the property. You guys would be shocked at the amount of encroachments we are finding in like the last six months. I've been in this industry for six years. I've not seen this amount of encroachments as we are seeing recently because my neighbor next door during Harvey, we flooded, blah, blah, blah. We have to put up a new fence. And now the fence is in my, it's in a part of my land or it's part of my lot. And now it brings my easements and more depending on where that easement line is for the county and the um, utility districts. And then vice versa. Now, my neighbor had no idea that they were doing that because when the fence went up, like they didn't know. I didn't know. No one knew, right? We thought we were putting it in the same place. A lot of the Harvey victims are now coming out with, this. we're having so many survey issues. So just keep that in mind. But part of our job is to make sure that even if you guys have an existing survey where nothing has changed, that is something that we do make sure there are no encroachments on the property as it sits. So what happens at that point in time, like if a fence is- So let's like say hypothetically. So two things, one, scenario one, you, you were neighbors, you sign off saying, okay, you know what, it's, it's fine. We've got to get, now we've got to get a new survey. Your you as my neighbor have to get a new survey, even though you're not selling, because now we have to make sure that it's all legal and it's all filed with the county, that this is what it is. Now, if you're a butthole of a neighbor and you're like, no, I want my two inches, then it, the, whoever put our fence up has to come back out remove the fence and we still both of us still have to get a new survey and file it with the county which was going to delay closing about 30 to 45 days depending on where we are yes okay <laughs> which takes us to the next one what happens when there's encroachments on property so as you can see like even this is typically speaking in our area in the katie area you won't find fences like this right a lot of the time this is more in like the outer farmland areas. But even with that, we will be more than happy to, as long as there are no changes on the survey, we'll make sure that it's no changes, do the T47 and move on so there's no extra charges for any of the parties. Okay, acceptance for the surveys, the plat, what they look like. So let's say that we've got, okay, Perfect example, your seller, there was, you know, DR Horton build and Tamron, which is out in the newer, newer part of Katie. Katie's grown so much now, so you don't, don't know. So DR Horton had a, a, initially got a loan for $2 million and your seller's going to close their file. Yes. Now they're, now they're sellers. They've purchased now they're sellers. When the file must have gotten closed with the DR Horton title company or whatever title company, this can happen and there's many scenarios this can happen in. There's a lien for $2 million. All we need is a partial release as a title company, which you're looking at me like, oh my God. So obviously we know, you know, the, the sale of the house is 300,000. There's really not a $2 million lien, but what's happening is they got filed with the county. They got either misfiled or maybe the partial lien got misplaced. So all we need as a title company is a partial lien from the previous title company that closed the file in order for us to file it with the county because the plaques, what you're seeing those large liens on, and as the real estate agent or as the consumer, all they see is a $2 million lien. And they're like, oh my God, because they do get the commitment, right? At the beginning of the, when we first open title, they get a commitment showing exactly what's on schedule C and what the liens are. And all they're expecting is a payoff for their mortgage company. They're not expecting a $2 million partial lien. So this is what that looks like from our point of view. How are the consumers? Can you guys hear on Zoom? Sometimes we do walk away from Zoomers? Can you please share your screen with us on Zoom? Can I share what? Can we share what? Your your screen with us. Oh, you're not seeing it. Oh, why didn't you all say something? Because we don't see the presentation on Zoom. What? That's a big oopsies. What the hell have you been looking at this whole time? <laughs> we, were, we were listening only. We're all laughing at you now. I we saw your picture. We just couldn't see the screen. You missed Karen. They've been seeing your picture this whole time. What? <laughs> Well, now we're going to look at you. How's that? 
<laughs> I'm so sorry. That's an epic fail. Hey, look, you can just, I'll, I'll, here, fast track. That's what you missed. <laughs> we'll, we'll send it, we'll email you over the, um, the PowerPoint. The PowerPoint. Well. Yeah, I'll, I'll email it to you guys. I'm yeah. glad I checked in with y'all. Okay, I know. we're Thank good. You, <laughs> You're all welcome, guys. All right, take over. <laughs> so loud. Yes. <laughs> So the search, of course, and same exact thing. We just sort of went over what um, other parties that provide, for example, when we've got title, um, files that have closed with other title companies previously, really all we need as the title company that's currently doing it. And another really great thing about Fidelity or even the large um, underwriters is that we're able to pull the files because again, they probably underwrote with us, right? So if your seller's like, I know for a fact I have my survey, I just don't know where it is. Like I can't find it. I'm shuffling through all my stuff. Whoever they closed with, they could have closed with tradition title, with frontier title, whatever title company that they previously closed their home with, we can look it up, make sure even if they don't have the time to call title companies to get their survey, um, we can also look it up and get the survey. The their existing server to see if we could do a T47 if nothing's changed to their acknowledgement. Question. Of course. Every title company offers that. Like if the, the seller say, I cannot find it, but I closed with this title company. Yes. Yeah. We, any title company can call anyone, can call, you know, one, two, three title company down the street and ask, hey, you know, you guys closed on one, two, three Happy Street and we're closing the sellers, they're moving, can you please send us the existing survey? That's a plus if you just state that they do have it with the T47 and saying buyers, buyers should get a new survey because that's like you said, additional 500 dollars. Right. That would, that would help. Okay. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. If, and a lot of the time the sellers, if they, I mean, look, I'm in this industry and I will tell you all the most embarrassing story of all time. I didn't file for homestead exemption for three years. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I do this for a living. I was like, what? So a lot of the times the sellers will forget, they'll misplace their documents. I mean, it happens to all of us, right? So if they remember at least who they closed with, where they closed, or we, you can look it up, we can look it up on HAR to see what title company it was closed with previously. Um, if it was listed through HAR, as long as it wasn't a for sale by owner or anything like that, then we would be able to find the existing survey. The T47 affidavit. So as Ms. Karen mentioned, and um, as I mentioned earlier, so the most important thing, and as long as nothing's changed to the property, we will do a T47. A lot of the time, time is of the essence, yes. So we have to make sure that the T47 is into us as the title company in a timely manner. So by doing the virtual online um, signing, DocuSign, and then making sure that we have it at the closing table, we'll do the what signature that alleviates some of that stress from your sellers and from you guys, because depending on who's on the other side, your buyer's agent on the other side of the contract, they'll be hounding for it because understandably so, right? You want your buyer to make sure that we have an existing survey. And if we don't, then we need a new one that we did yesterday. So this is just what a survey would look like. We've got right here, our stamp, never eat sour watermelon the verbiage here, and it, this is any survey, doesn't matter when it was done, we'll have something to this format. And this is what we would need for it to be accurate. Question. <laughs> Told you it was much shorter than Ms. Garen's. <laughs> oh, you just got the Zoomers on and battery <laughs> I'm so sorry, Zoomers. I, I emailed it to Ms. Karen. I was like, all right, I guess we're gonna go, let's do this. Got a lot of technology. Do you guys have any questions? Yes, ma'am. So, so if any modification has been made to the property, if a new fence has gone in, that requires a new survey to make sure that the fence falls within, if that's above ground swimming pool or if So it has to be structural changes. Like let's, um, Let's say they added the above fence, the above um, pool, but there was around it, you put concrete or you put 
walking, like something that is structural to the actual property that cannot just be moved, then absolutely. If it's an above pool, um, above ground pool, and it doesn't have anything around it, we have no sort of no decking with footing or right, no steps going up it, nothing that we can't remove, then no man. But if it's any sort of decking, the slightest, but even if we've got the um, you know the little stepping stones, yeah, that's structural, right? Because you have to have the stairs to go up into the pool. That can't you can't just remove that. Then you would absolutely need a new survey. And the new fence thing, personally, I don't care how much money the house is, whether it's a hundred thousand, a million dollars, whatever I'm buying, I'd want to know that there are no encroachments on my property. That's just me. Not all buyers are the same. Some people want to get it in and be done with it. I would recommend all oh, it's five hundred dollars on a even if it's a hundred thousand dollar investment. I mean, that's just what I would recommend. And so for the cash buyers on the flip homes, they want to save the money and not do it. So then the buyer can furnish so a survey if, or use the existing one if nothing or we don't need a survey. We as a title company don't require it, so we don't need it. So they never, your seller never has to disclose it. They never have to give it to me, you, anyone. Your buyer is fine with it. Then in a master plan community, knock on what I'm gonna say this out loud. It's very difficult to mess something up. Like we're going into Cross Creek. Perry Homes is building X amount of homes. I'm an investor, I wanna pick up for Perry Homes, whatever, DR Horton, it's very difficult. I won't need a survey, right? It's a master plan community. In a older community, in a newer community where it's just a couple of homes, I may want one, just in case. So that's what I would typically say. Okay, I just sold a home in a very small town. You wouldn't believe the service. So it was, uh, well, there was small laws, I guess. So uh, it consisted of lot eight, nine, and 10. And the neighbors almost had a hit. Well, they did, from what I understand, after the survey was done, that we actually included lot seven and it almost took their driveway. Mm -hmm. Can you please? Does that happen a lot with surveys? Make mistakes. That's a big mistake. Um, we just had a file that um in Galveston County, beautiful house, listed at um six hundred thousand, price dropped by a hundred thousand dollars. All these great, wonderful things. Yes, the H A R um pictures showed a second. <coughs> Like you would not believe how beautiful this house was. And in addition to that, you have a second lot, which you can build a pool on. You can build another home on anything, right? Everyone's happy, go lucky. Contract gets written. We're all under contract. Our, um, our plant, our examiners are going through. They get through, they're like, oh, wait a second. We've got two different names. We've got a name on our contract and we've got a name that's showing on the tax records. Those are two separate, completely separate names.